Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. Listen, Ku, I don't remember it, but my mom told me once when I was little, I, I fell into a podcast. They said they'd ended it and re-recorded things on top, but I just remembered the podcast was called, its name was the Kaku Podcast. Your real name is Kaku Podcast! Kaku Podcast? So doing the river speed. I don't know. Okay. You'll find out at the end of this episode the adversity I had to overcome in order to start this podcast. Okay, 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 okay. Now, we were talking about something very serious. Talking about Shrek. We were talking tunes. And, of course, we were contrasting Spirited Away to Shrek with yes. our guest, who has never seen Shrek. No. And I made a joke about how Shrek opens, and you said that is not actually how Shrek starts, is it? And then I showed you the opening of Shrek, <laughs> and you are really Now I am broken. You are broken. <laughs> what did you think Shrek was? Like, you knew he was a I know ogre. Shrek is about a big, big green, green guy. ogre, and right. that it's like a fairy tale world, and mm -hmm. that right. I knew that Eddie Murphy was in it. It's Donkey. And, um, Donkey. I assumed it was like probably kind of knowing and cynical in the way that all Very. contemporary kids' culture is, it, which is I, so I would disgusting. Say but was, I didn't know it was going to open with him literally like ripping a page out of a fairy tale book and wiping his butt yep. with it. Right. And then f also flushing, flushing an outhouse. Flushing an outhouse old. toilets. Like, okay, I guess this is a fantasy world, but whatever. <laughs> right. There's a flushing sound and he walks out That's of a so, wooden outhouse. <laughs> I don't know. You're saying like the and way, then all star play, right? Yeah, the, then, right. Then, and then that's, a pop and that's song all, but that and it's right. already being played ironically, right? No, mm, no, kind of. What's weird? What is, year did it come out? Two thousand one. Okay, so this is two years after All Star comes out as the single from the Mystery Men soundtrack. That's right. It had been. I see. Part of it's another a movie. A song that originates right. in another movie. Right. It was sort of right. like the video for it has like clips from Mystery Men. Right. right. And then two years later, it's like Mystery Men bombed. All Star was a hit. They're sort of taking a hit song two years late. Right. It has nothing to do with Shrek, though. No, it's like if a. I a, guess he's an all star. I don't like. It doesn't. The lyrics have no real he's a star relation. Of his own right. movie. He's it's a, almost yeah. like if an animated he's film movie started star. with like uh, Shake It Off. Or I really, really right. like you today. Yeah, yeah. Like this was like a legitimate hit song. But then the other thing is that Rat Race came out the same year, and 2001. Also ends with and ends with them arriving at a Smash Mouth concert and dancing to All Star. What's Rat Race? Another cartoon? It was no, it was no. A, a comedy with like a big ensemble. It's sort of like a, what do you? What's like Cannonball Run? It or was like a, it was oh, like right. a it was like Rowan Atkinson, Whoopi Goldberg. Right, that was like, the idea. And yeah, it's, it's, they've all got to find the money. They're in a rat race like around the country. It's right. a Fallen That's from it. Grace, Jerry Zucker. Yeah, it's, it's Zucker, one of the three. But just airplanes. the one Zucker, and it's like John Cleese and Dave Thomas run a casino, and they offer like $100 million to the first person who can get to whatever the location is. Got it. And it's like Whoopi Goldberg, John Lovitz, Rowan Atkinson, yeah. Seth Green. John Cleese, Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr., the biggest comedy stars of 2000. Why wasn't this the hugest hit movie ever? They that sounds good. I think it did okay, actually. I mean, they Rat, really... It's called Rat Race? Rat Race. Rat never Rat heard Race. of it. Uh, John Cleese is like the evil billionaire who's right. organized the Rat Race. Here they all are. Yeah, that's the, the poster. poster. The poster had this sort of... <laughs> Big heads. Big head. Amy Smart. Wow. Amy Smart. Uh, there's a lot of, because there's also, like, Brecken Mayer is in it, right? right. Like, there's a lot of other people in that movie. the romantic cheap. lead. It's kind of cheap. And it's also one of those things where, you're like, it's a mad, 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 mad world right. outside of the main cast. When they go to a cameo, you're like, holy shit. Right. It's the Three Stooges. Sir John Gilgood. Right. And Taylor <laughs> Swift. And, and the in, first on screen pairing. In this, the biggest <laughs> stars are the people who are the main characters. When they go to a cameo, it's like Dean Kane. Yeah, right? or and you're like, Smash Mouth. Right. Is that supposed to be like a, a big like aha moment? Um, right. It ends with Smash Mouth. Shrek starts with Smash Mouth. The point is you were saying like this is like everything I hate about children's films today. I need to have the pop song, the cynical stuff. Shrek is the moment when all of that becomes like, oh, this is good. This can be taken seriously. Well, right. I always associated that 
with Aladdin, which I've also never seen. Because isn't Aladdin the one where Robin Williams is the genie uh-huh. and he like will Aladdin, turn to the camera and be like, I know you parents think this movie sucks. I do too. Ha ha, wink, wink. And they it's go not, back to the but movie. But it's not like that. But Aladdin is like the seed being planted. It has the right. elements right. of that. Right. Like and it's then, the first time that that's happening. Right. right. Katzenberg – Comes off of that and goes like, "This is what we should be doing." And they're all like these stories, stars above the title, right. like in a, in a kids cartoon. Right. We're gonna put Mike Myers' name above the title. Right. 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 But they're all the stories about like when they were doing uh, Toy Story, when they were like doing story reels on Toy Story that Katzenberg kept on pushing them to be like the characters should like really be assholes. Like it should be really cynical and more pop culture references. Like he was taking all the wrong lessons from Aladdin and they almost shut down Toy Story because they were like, "This is." unwatchable this is like a, right like everyone's a, a jerk movie. right, well, right. Why, why is right. woody why, isn't he supposed to be the hero like why right. is he so mean and all the directors at disney were like fighting against him like pushing for that and then he goes over to dreamworks and he's like i can do whatever the fuck i want and shrek is like the culmination moment and it wins best animated film the first ever best animated film at the oscars and it gets nominated for the palm door and it is taken so seriously as a movie that then culture just completely warps around it. Because right. Aladdin, like, those elements were popular, but they but only— Aladdin is a stirring, right. old-fashioned adventure movie right. with songs that are right. beautiful and it looks nice. That's, like, 15% of the movie because it's only and this then, one And then Robin Williams is in there, and he's not turning to the camera, but he's, cl- right. you know, and he's, like, right. he's doing, like, a Carson routine, but he's also It takes 40 minutes for him lovable. to enter. But like, then Shrek, everything is, like, fucked. No one's fucking lovable in Shrek. They're all jerks. But at the time, everyone— Loved it. Well, everyone loved it because they they were sick of Disney. Right. It's 2001. The sort of Disney renaissance is kind of sputtering out. I see. Right. They just made Tarzan. People are kind of like, we get this formula. We're bored of it. And Shrek's like, I get the formula too. Ha ha ha. Right. Like all the sort of like Gen X-y like Disney's actually like fucked. Like if you read the real stories, they're so dark. Right. That whole take had become so mainstream that like any like six-year-old at a mall could get what Shrek was like hitting on right and then the weird thing is for a generation the versions the parody versions of the fairy tale characters in shrek canonically become those characters right like there's a generation like my sister who didn't grow up watching the disney films she grew up watching the fucking like she's watching the ironic commentary on the source code and that is the new and that is the new Canon, right? The new with source code. creepy, like fucking right. seven dwarves and, and glass, glassy CG, who's a pathological and right. liar, and like all these things. Right? Um, fairy tales, man. They're just like you know, that's all right. made up. Those are fairy tales, right. man. Right. Right. The real world, like we're in Bosnia. What's going on there? Yeah. Right. Why doesn't Aladdin talk about Bosnia? But as you said, the movie was not only for best screenplay. Like it was. Yeah. Taken, people were like, "Oh, this is fantastic." They were like, it's "Animation so has right. finally become adult." Like, finally, there's, like, a serious animated film. Also, people thought it looked good, and now you watch it, and you're like, oh, this looks dreadful. Rough, like, terrible. Yeah, yeah, right. It was, like, them trying to go photorealistic. That's the weird thing. Yeah, she looks like, like a little person. The, right. The, the humans. And Shrek's got, of. like, stubble and shit. Like, they were, like, trying to get all, like, the gross details down. But yeah, another— I mean, Like, the villain looks, like, creepy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Do you think it was good— for for the culture, Shrek? I think it was terrible for the culture. Really? Yeah, I think it actually caused... Because of the kind of cynicism it. or the... Yeah, I yeah. Mean, this is the kind of stuff I talk about all the time. Like, yes. Danny McBride is why Trump got elected. South Park is why Trump got elected. <laughs> Shrek is like why Trump got elected. You keep standing on that street corner yeah. and just yelling I love it. It's people. a lonely street corner, but someday, <laughs> someday people will stop and... Stop honking their homes and get out and take my pamphlets. For a second, I processed the first thing you said as Danny Boyle is why Trump got elected. I mean, he probably is too. Fuck it. I I was trying to do the calculus. What's David's beef with Steve Jobs? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, No, I think Shrek is really bad for the culture. And I think a a thing that it did, which I resent, is um, people then start to feel like they're hip to the things that stories are doing. You know, like, do you notice this is like a well, trope? Like, this always happens. This is something I want. And wanted, then we get yeah, like Deadpool I, or whatever. You know, right. Right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just keeps going further down. This is another th- another one of my little hobby horses that I'll delight you with later. Yeah, which is about people being clued into like story structure and stuff. That's what right. uh, I think. Acts. All this stuff is keyed, which it's like storytelling tropes existed because they were field tested for centuries, and we right. figured out these were the most effective ways to tell emotional stories. And now I feel like people are scared off of doing 
functional storytelling because they're like, oh, but this is like that cliche. Yeah, but I do think sincerity is now kind of back. It's as coming well. like, back. You know, there's two heads to the it's dragon coming back. now, right? But I do think I think that's a problem is that like everyone thinks they're smart to how stories work. Like well, plot the whole culture. Oh yeah, that's true. Like all the sort of like honest trailers are right. Like, Everything wrong with X movie in ten seconds. I like, think I'm talking more about some, <laughs> Iron Man. Get there with like yeah. <laughs> there's that, there. but I th- but I also think there's this I I think it's part of a broader phenomenon which I associate with the popularity of inter- Entertainment Weekly magazine. Uh huh. Okay. Which was Another like sort of early nineties. Which was invention. kind of like now everybody understands what a tentpole movie is sure. and, wa- and wants also, to right, right. wants to talk about, about awards, opening season, box right. office, and right. everyone is like an industry insider. I'm not right. saying like that knowledge should be held by a secret cabal of power players, and uh, we're not worthy of it. But <laughs> why are you a, handing it, me a list of a, <laughs> power all players power underlined? <laughs> but I think the 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 other side of that is. This idea of people being like, oh, my God, Pixar really knows story. Like, they can really crack a story. The structure of this Pixar movie is so amazing. But they wouldn't be able to, like, expand on that. Well, right, exactly. Right. And, and I don't know. Maybe, I mean, it's, I guess it's not Pixar's fault. And I, it's the knowingness. It's all part of a culture, I guess, of, of um, knowingness. I don't well, know how else to say it. Whether it's a movie you, yeah. that is being self-referential so about so its smart, source right. material right. Right. or whether it's people not responding to the story as a story but responding to it as a story, as a as an doing instantiation yes. right. of a structure you know, I that can think, be built yes. more or less elegantly. I think you know that is I mean? also the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Is really? It's a thing that's like letting the audience in on – the act of franchise building that they're right. doing. Right. They're like your your investors with us in this like ongoing narrative. Right. And so much of like the Marvel culture is people speculating about what's going to happen in the next movie and then right. going yeah, and having yeah. their theories confirmed or denied and then walking out of that and being like, wow, but look at what it sets up going forward. Right. Like there are like two Marvel movies that end with any sense of finality. Because Very most true, Marvel right. movies end with a scene that negates whatever the emotional ending of the movie was. Right. Which I mean, uh, they put like a secret scene at the end of the trailer. And sometimes then, like, that. Sometimes it's sometimes in the it's movie. Literally the oh, really? ending. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like whatever sense of emotional closure, narrative closure we came to on this two-hour narrative is upended by needing to point your head right. towards yeah. what's happening next. Right. So mm-hmm. you can start speculating and the idea of how they're growing everything out and the fact that like everyone knows how many movies. Marvel actors have left on their contract. Right, things like that, where they're like, "Yeah, and well, I it's weird that she died, but I know that she's optioned for a 2021 right. prequel." Now, David like, and I are people who obviously were forged in the fires of knowing these things. Right, you're the you're the EW and I understand the appeal about, of knowing right. it because it's fun because then you feel like you are on the inside. Right, you have inside information, or it's kind of like I can see the strings of the puppets. You know, totally. like totally. But I like was obsessed with trying to figure this stuff out because I wanted to be making this stuff, and David was obsessed with trying to figure this stuff out. Because he wanted to like be critically like analyzing this stuff. I guess so. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it's weird that like people who are like, uh, you know, I'm I like uh, uh, I, I'm trying to think of any job, and then I'm getting caught in the web of being like, well, any job I say now sound backhanded, you know? But like someone who's like an act- brain surgeon, brain surgeon, the world's greatest brain surgeon, the world's greatest brain surgeon, Doctor also Strange? being like, well, they're definitely killing Carson. Chris Evans off in this movie right. because I heard he's fulfilled his six movie contract. Right. Like that's weird that he feels like he needs to know that. It is weird that Brent Carson was a brain surgeon who was good at his job. He was incredibly good at his <sighs> he job. He was like really good at it. He was so yeah. good that Cuba Gooding Jr. played him. Yeah. Cuba Gooding Jr. got to play him. A thing we can only aspire to. Um, but you know what Hayao Miyazaki would say to this generation? This is all kind of relevant. Do you know what he would say? Oh, absolutely. You it's need all to kind of you relevant. need to like yeah. get a job and scrub some floors. Yeah. Like that's that'll build your character. I just think it's fascinating that Shrek and Spirited Away, the movie that we're talking about today, come out in the same year. Spirited Away is released in the United America States the next a year, year later. Right. 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 They it, are both 2001 releases. Right. right. But in America, it wins the second ever best animated right. Oscar. Shrek won the first. And when when best animated like feature was established, people were like, "This is the Pixar ca- category." Like Pixar right, movies right. have become respected right. enough. Right. They will surely dominate. Right. right. And in fact, the first two years, it's DreamWorks. The first year, Shrek beats Monsters Inc. because Monsters Inc. was sort of, I guess, seen as like, "Oh, well, that's like a soft Pixar movie," and Shrek is here to like tear Everyone up the was system. Like, yeah, Monsters Inc. is like a pleasant, like, but obviously a very light. It's not a serious film. Right. And, and then, now, like, Monsters, Inc. is, like, a paragon of storytelling. 
Uh-huh. And uh, Shrek no one likes. Like, even the kids who grew up with Shrek now just make Shrek dank memes. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't help dank that they Shrek made, like, so Shrek four has, more Shrek. Shrek has not aged well. I don't Shrek think, has aged very badly. I don't think there are, like, parents showing their kids Shrek. It, right. The bell of the ball. Exactly. Yeah. Ooh, no longer. Turned into a pumpkin. That sounds like right. a joke Shrek would make. <laughs> really? <laughs> Fuck my life. So uh, I've, uh, I've even, through osmosis, been influenced by Shrek. Am I incorrect in thinking that in Shrek that they turn a, an onion into a carriage? That sounds right. I think they There's do some that. joke about onions. A lot of jokes. Ogres are like onions. They have layers. Right. Uh, and this is a podcast, of course, about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their career and give a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Our producer is tilting his head back and looking at the ceiling as if to say, what am I doing here? Uh, it's called Blank Check. Griffin, David, I'm Griffin. Hi, I'm David. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce baby. It's a mini series on the films of Hayao Miyazaki. It's called Howl's Moving Podcastle. That's right. And our guest today, a returning guest, longtime aspirational returning guest, David Rees. Hi, here. thanks for having me back. Excited to be here. Now, we wanted you on the show when we started the show, and you said, I'll come on if you talk about AI. And it was one of the reasons we decided to do late period Spielberg. That's right. Because we were like, we can get Rees on the show. And then... Very shortly after that, we'd like we'd love to have you back. And you were like, I'd come on to talk about Miami Vice or Spirited Away. And it's one of the reasons we did Michael Mann and Miyazaki back to back. Because we were like, we'll get him on one of them. Yeah, here I am. Here you are. <laughs> Wait, you don't seem excited. I'm just bummed about the Miami Vice one, man. I was so amped. Um, but I'll let it go. I already yelled at you at a dinner party about it. And- you've yelled at me at multiple dinner right. parties. Anyway, you're here for the you're here I for my, white, what I brought my special folder. He's, He's got, got a Manila folder. folder. He's got yeah. a folder. You're so here to I, talk about what might be the best movie ever made. Well, I'm so excited now to hear you say that. I got, got a little goosebumps on my arm because I'm well. Let's, Every time I watch it, I'm like, really? I'm kind of like, well, I mean, I don't know that you could do something better than this. I, I'm sure you don't agree with me completely. Well, no, I was gonna say so. I. I uh, so saw this movie. Griffin's more of a neophyte to Miyazaki is the sort of okay. arc of this. This is my exposure story. therapy, this, this miniseries. Uh, I had been shown Totoro when I was a child. Didn't get it. Mm-hmm. And didn't try to engage with the other Miyazaki movies. And then when this came out in the States, it was such a big sensation. that I was like, gotta see it. And I was also an Oscar junkie at that point. A right. thing that unified David and I was that we were 13-year-old Oscar. Industry insiders reading Entertainment right. Weekly magazine. Right, complaining Bafo about the fact. Bio for that, Miyazaki's latest tentpole. Yeah. We, look, we were real insiders, right. and we hate the fact that everyone's an insider now. I know. God, everyone's trying to tell me how Oscar season right, works. Exactly. I'm like, I've been, uh, what, what's, what did the Star Wars guys say? I've been, I've been working I've been this street. I've busting my ass. On Star Wars five years. Yeah. Um, but uh, saw saw this when it came out in the States, the dub version, and went, yeah, I just totally don't get this. I was 14 at the time, maybe 13, and I was Really? Like, you were that? Yeah, okay, 13, comes out sure. of two? Oh, yeah, two, I yeah, was 13, right, right, right. and I was like, don't, don't get this. Uh-huh. And just... Don't get it in a bad way, I guess you're saying? Yeah, I was like, I don't understand what people are connecting to You're not here. like... I don't understand, and then it's so wonderful. I feel overwhelmed. <laughs> no, I was right. like, I don't understand what the thing is. Here. Right, yeah. And clearly I'm in the minority. I, I have a lot of the same. I mean, I saw it as a full adult, and I also, yeah. but, well, we'll get into well, it. Yeah, we'll get into it. Right, but so this may series is me being like, I want to I wanna watch all of these and see if I can uh, crack right. this. Yeah. And it's all sort of been building up to this one, being like, can I revisit this movie for the first time in almost 20 years? Right. Yeah. And make sense of it. So you haven't seen it since you saw it in O two. The wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And right. I saw it dubbed, and I watched it subbed oh, right. last okay. night. Yeah. And uh, I I was watching, it and I was like, this is kind of uh, just a completely undeniably powerful object. Yeah. Like I was kind of stunned that there was ever a time where I wasn't connecting with it. Mm-hmm. Like even if this isn't my favorite movie, and I wouldn't put it on my personal top ten greatest films of all time certainly list. Certainly would. I was like watching it. I was like, right. I was like, this is like the Sistine Chapel or something. This is like some undeniable accomplishment in humanity. Right. Right. I fully came to the thing. Right. 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 Is now the time? Take it out. Okay. He's opened the folder. He has a clipping. A yellow a piece of clipping. newspaper. Well, it's, now, only, it's, it's the yellow because it's the, it's the oh, okay. financial Which time. is salmon colored. It's always famously. been this color. Right. Right. So he's got a locked piece of newspaper. The reason here. that I really wanted to do Spirited Away is because it, it is, I think, undeniably the work of a total genius. Uh-huh. Even if it's somewhat inaccessible for, 
cultural reasons or hey, psychological reasons or whatever. I agree fully. But for me, I think the thing that I've thought about almost as much as I've thought about Spirited Away is a review of Spirited Away that I read and then clipped, as you can see, from the Financial Times, this, uh, September 2003. And so, by the way, when we were recording our AI episode, you invoked this. I did? Did you? I don't remember oh, that. Really? on oh. mic, but it was either before or after oh, the recording, okay, okay, and you okay. said, do you guys remember that review? Oh, right. So this is stuck this in is, your head. I mean, yeah, yes. yeah. So, yes. Yes. Back, uh, so here's some context. When Spirited Away came out, I was at the time a political cartoonist, and I had all these file folders where I would keep track of, like, Afghan atrocities, Iraqi atrocities, uh-huh. just, like, all these horrible file folders that were depressing to look at. And then I had this other file folder I just called Great Writing, <laughs> and there was just stuff in here that I really enjoyed, like, this is a list of all of Cool Keith's personas. Oh, that's cool. Dr. Octagon, Fly Ricky the Wine Taster, Mr. Gerbic. It always just made me happy to have this. And then uh, this, is a, this is an academic article written by my godfather called Treatment of Hernia in the Later Middle Ages, Surgical <laughs> Correction and Social Construction. My godfather is a, a historian of medicine. This is a very intense wow. article about how they performed hernias in 1300s. But it's well written. Then I have this invoice for these incredibly dangerous magnets that I bought that almost tore my uh, uh, marriage apart. But <laughs> the, um, like through magnet force, <laughs> like they, <they're, laughs> like physically, you they were, were these magnets that were so, magnet. <laughs> they're called uh, Gauss boy super magnets. They were these magnets that were so powerful, they were dangerous. I could not believe I was legally allowed to order these <laughs> magnets because I mean they could go through. You had to keep them away really? from credit cards and pacemakers, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they were so powerful. And one time, I was trying to—I was doing what you're not supposed to do, which is like, um, like similar polarities. Yeah, oh, right, right, right. Opposing, but it yeah, flipped right. around, and part of the magnet flew. A shard of the magnet flew across the kitchen and um, almost took out my ex-wife's eye. Anyway, wow. can I? Do you mind? I won't say it on mic. Can I look at the invoice? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. You saying that you shouldn't have been able to buy these? I'm curious. The pr- wow, that is cheap. Right? Can I see? That is – Now I want to see. And you got a discount. You got a price, price break disc. Wow. I can't believe something this dangerous could cost this little money. Right. Okay. Oh, so – right. I mean, yeah. Even in 2002 or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. We well, will they, not say huh, how you used to live down there. Was it nice down there? <laughs> it was a time of transition down there. I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. It was a time of transition. Anyway, I, so – I imagine it was really cheap to live down there back then. Uh, Cheaper. I don't know. I Maybe will not. say I'll probably never live in as nice an apartment as I lived in down there. Wow. wow. I will say, too, I mean, David had primed me with live down there. I was not expecting this far down. And we will yeah. not say how far down you live. I was pretty far down, pretty man. Far These down. days, yeah. people live down there yeah, like, yeah, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time. Back, like, then, back then, know, it was like real ur- urban, urban, urban very, pioneers very living time. down there. Yeah. Okay, anyway. Financial Times. <laughs> Spirited Away Review. Okay. The author? I, is Nigel Andrews, who I think is still the finance. In fact. I believe you're right. He is because I have since been in touch with him in anticipation of this podcast. What? Recording. He's 72 years old. Yep. Uh, he's he's sort of wow. emeritus. Uh, yeah, yeah, years. totally, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I I love this review. I'm not going to read the entire review, but you're going to have to indulge me and let me read Please. certain sections yes. of this review. 100%. And the first thing I noticed, I can't remember if I read this review before or after I saw Spirited Away. But the day- Were you a frequent reader of the Financial Times? Was it just – Oh, well, I was a political cartoonist. I was a subscriber. Sure. I subscribed to the Financial Times and the New York Times and 100 million policy journals. Right. Um, And I liked Nigel Andrews' reviews. Like, he reviewed a lot of international movies and stuff. Right, absolutely. Sure, great critic. So the thing to know about this review (laughs) is that Nigel Andrews grades movies on a star system, Mm -hmm. one through five stars. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I noticed about this review was it's six stars. (laughs) He broke his own star system. <laughs> so when I first picked it up, I was like, that's a printing error. Like, with <laughs> six stars, and Mr. Andrews only goes to five stars. First sentence of his review. Yes, that's right. Six stars. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Get ready. David exactly. is suplexing. In I this know, studio. exactly. Sort of like, sort this of like review get... gets me so fucking amped. That's, okay, I mean, listen to this. I, that's, I'm, this I'm, is I'm, when it's like, yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Somebody liked a movie. My adrenaline right? is yeah, yeah, really okay, high yeah, right Totally, now. totally. <laughs> yes, that's right. Six stars. <laughs> Exception must be made for the exceptional. Wow. Spirited Away is a feast of wonderment, a movie classic, and a joy that will enrich your existence until you two are spirited away. Rush now. 
while life lasts. It is wow. pretty crazy to, to wow. say, like, not only is this a great movie that you should see, but this might be a thing you remember until you die. Which oh, you will. Oh, oh, yeah. But but more importantly, you do not want to risk dying before you see this film. Totally. Do not leave. Yeah, right, right exactly, exactly. Your, Death is inevitable. Right. Seeing Spirited Away is right. up to you. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I right. can't imagine anyone who's like, see Shrek now while life lasts. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But for Spirited Away, it's like... Uh, this is part of the core curriculum, y'all. Yeah. Right. You so might get hit by a bus. Here, I think. Yeah. yeah here's here's. Spirit I think this first. is the this is the core of the entire review. Okay. This is a, he's summarizing everything and putting it in the context of Princess Mononoke and all this stuff. What is the film about? It's about 122 minutes mm. and 12 billion years. Ten comedy points. It sums up all existence and gives us a mythology that's good for every society, amoeba, animal, or human that ever lived. And then the other thing he says is, uh, when he's talking about the final act of the, of the film, I love this. He says, Miyazaki supplies a coda, really a whole last act that's so ravishing and imaginative that Keatsianly, we want to give up and expire on the spot. He wanted this movie to kill him. Yes. <laughs> do you know well, what I mean? It's just that thing of yeah. like, I don't think I can do better than this. Like, yeah. maybe this should be the moment. Yeah, well, well, right. Exactly. I think away. that's why he gave it six out of five stars. And the reason that I've always found this review so just like exciting and also moving is I think this is a record of someone having an encounter with the sublime. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. 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 Which right. I think this movie, even me, like there's a lot about this movie I don't understand and there's yeah. a lot about this movie that's opaque to me. But Same I here. understand how someone could watch this movie and just feel like this is on a whole different level. Yes. You know, this, there's something about it that is just – I don't know if it's the dream logic or it's just some of those incredible images, you know, but it's just like – this is six out of five stars. Yeah, I also think the key difference is I have had encounters with the sublime that I completely understand would not connect for most people. Right. But I watched Spirit Away and I'm like, this movie is capturing the sublime for two hours. Yeah, yeah. Even if I am not as in on it as perhaps Nigel is. Right. Which, let me say, I think this movie is great. I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, I love it. I feel like I need to watch it eight more times. Uh, it was weird to me not having seen it since 2002. Mm. When I would run it in my head, I'd be like, I barely remember any of that movie. Mm. And as I watched it, everything was You're like, oh, there. I do actually remember this. Right. Like right. every element, suddenly I was like, wait, I know the score. I know the yeah, images. Yeah. Pretty much the greatest score. The score yeah. is right. pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was yeah. like, I had no sort of replay, recall in my head before rewatching it. And it all unfolded like this experience of, um, I feel like very often I wake up and I don't remember my own dreams. Right. And then something happens over the course of the day. And you go back. Yeah, totally. And suddenly in, the entire right, like, dream I, comes right, right, flooding right, back right, to right. me. Yeah. And it's very emotionally overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, right, in my dream, someone held my hand. And now that someone has held my hand in real life, I'm remembering this dream where I was in like the fires of hell. In your bread. hand hell. Right. Well, Sorry, right. retired bit. Um, wh whatever the thing is, right? And yeah. watching this felt like that where I'm like emotionally overwhelmed with the idea of this thing that was sort of like – buried deep in my unconscious, which yeah, I had yeah, not yeah. connected with before. Right. Had no emotional connection to the last time I saw it. Now suddenly having this like tremendous weight and feeling like it was like this unspoken thing that had been laying dormant. I think that's why this movie is so powerful. And I think, and I mean, I should preface all this by saying like, I don't know enough about Japanese culture to really understand everything that's going on in this movie, but we can talk about that in a minute. But what I wanted to say was I think one of the reasons this movie is so powerful is because it always does, at least to me, feel a little bit beyond my ken, so to speak. Sure, sure. There's always right, a right, reaching right. quality. And so when you come back to it, it does have that same kind of strange, surreal authority that a dream can have over you, yes. which is, again, almost like the same notion of the sublime. This is just a little beyond what you'll ever be able to understand. And when you watch it again, it's like, oh, my God, I'm back in that dream space. You, you know what I mean? I think that's what – I think that's why the movie can be so powerful. Yeah, I was thinking while watching this last night, not, not to get to like college dorm room philosophical, but it is this thing I love about movies that they are these fixed objects. Right. And that like we come to them at different points in our lives with right. different things. Right. 
And there are the movies, obviously, that you, like, rewatch more, that you think about more, that are your favorites, that you connected with the first time. It may be on further viewings, like, oh, well, now I have a better understanding of this, or I noticed this. Right. But things like this where it's, like, you know, you watch it, like, years apart, and you've changed, or your understanding of the world has changed, Mm -hmm. and some movies, like, don't benefit from that. But right. some yeah, movies yeah, yeah. remain these fixed objects where, like, because of how sort of elusive they are, wherever you are in your life, wherever the world is at that moment, you're going to be able to bring something new to it. And it's going to, like, unlock new stuff for you. Right. And that's probably, in the end, the difference between a movie like this and a movie like Shrek. And it's probably why Shrek is not aging well. Even though, yes. they're objectively, they're equally good because they both won Best Animated Feature. Right. Back right. To so back. that puts them one to one. Right. But this also won the – it was the – uh, won the Berlin Film Festival and the Golden mm-hmm. Bear uh, after its release, wow. which is hard to, you know, come yeah. out in Japan. Yeah. Then it played at the Berlin Film Festival. It won the festival. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it comes out in America. Mm-hmm. So it did that. Yeah. And also it was the highest grossing and remains the highest grossing film in Japanese history. It is. I think, yeah. you, yes. isn't your name? Your name got close, but I think it's number two. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought I think... your name sur- surpassed it, which is another incredible. Your name, I feel like, is a, is a it's easier to wrap your head around right. even though it's pretty trippy yeah it is trippy um but it's more like but spirited away is a film that uh you can think about forever right well yeah, i think there's and that every time yeah, i yeah. see it i I'm, i have new understanding about the yeah. world that this is your your name you can solve right Surprise. i think it's the difference between, i think all interesting movies are either puzzles or dreams and your name is a puzzle. God, that's an incredible one. It's true. And, and, uh, oh, and uh, Spirited, Spirited Away is a dream. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. 100%. And right. that's why you can, you'll can you be able to think about it, which is which I think is what Nigel Andrews is getting at in this oh, amazing oh, review right. where he's like, first of all, see this movie while life lasts. Mm-hmm. Second of all, you will want to die right. dur- because it's so sublime. Yeah. And third of all, it is about – uh, 12 billion years and all every conceivable society and the sum of all existence ever. Yeah. Right. It's, it's uh, inexhaustible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, no. I agree. Yeah. Ding dong. Jesus. What? Uh, nothing. Uh, answer the door. Go I'm ahead. just going to get the door. Sorry. 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 I feel like you're stuff. taking out frustration on me when I'm merely the person responding to the doorbell. Now, will you allow me to quickly open this door and see what? Or who is behind it? Yeah. Creek. This is the night, the beautiful night, and they call it dragon on it. Oh my God, David, do you see what's here at this little checkered table? No. Go ahead and describe it for me. It is a very classy, brown furred female dog. And she is sharing a big oh, bowl of pasta mm-hmm. with a stamp. It's the lady in the stamp, David. This <laughs> is the night. So they brought canceled. their own musical accompaniment. Yeah. Sure. It's the lady. Weird and- that they rang a doorbell, <laughs> that we opened the door, and then they, I guess, they set up. Well, first, like a little scene from an Italian restaurant with a dog and a stamp. One hair suit Italian man led the way with an accordion. Playing us a beautiful song. I mean, serenading us. Or so we thought until we saw that another hirsute Italian man was quickly setting up a table, two chairs, a bowl of spaghetti, a small female dog, and an anthropomorphized stamp. Okay, great. So that's a great setup. Uh, no one has time to go to the post office anymore. They're busy. Well, they're too busy setting up a romantic scene in the middle of our podcast studio. It makes sense. Or, you know, dealing with traffic and parking and lugging your mail and packages everywhere. And the point is that let me take a jeweler's loop to this stamp right here it looks like it was printed at home oh so it's a stamps.com stamp. oh, that's why the lady finds him so handsome uh because stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the u.s post office right to your computer not to an italian restaurant yeah. to your laptop i love when a bunch of people come into the studio and don't say anything and we just get to sort of comment on them yeah, you love that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, whether you're a small office sending invoices or an online seller shipping out products or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. I will say it. Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. This is a <laughs> night to print your own stamps 
Oh, he's like changed the lyrics well, to be about the. Well, he's a good waiter. He's, you he's, can simply use your computer to print official U.S. posters twenty four seven for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Once the mail is ready, just hand it to your mail carrier, drop it in the mailbox. It's that symbol. And you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to forty percent off priority mail with stamps dot com. Not to mention, it's a fraction. Of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, saving you time and money. It's no wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. Um, He's getting a little Dracula-esque, he is, I feel he is, like. He is. Yeah. Now, right now, our listeners can get a special offer. Right now. Don't wait. That includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. This deal is a la mode. Okay. Sure. Not saying there's ice cream ice on. Cream? I'm saying it's of the moment. Okay. Uh, just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, right and type now. in check. That's stamps.com, enter check, and uh, you can get the four week trial and the free postage and the digital scale. No commitment. And let me say, these stamps seem like a natural aphrodisiac because that dog is whew, really digging this stamp. Yeah. Can't stop licking the stamp. It is that that thing, I love dreams, but that it, when you do remember a dream vividly, that sense of like, I'm trying to pull apart why these elements came together. Right. Like, why did my brain construct this? Yeah. And why did I react to it this way? And the best movies, I think, do have that kind of quality where they can be a dream and a puzzle at the same time, which I think this movie weirdly does. Like, it's yeah. more a dream than a puzzle. You know? Right, yeah. But you're trying to figure out why it has that sort of impact that it does. And it's playing in a zone of, like, it's it's a very, like, Alice in Wonderland style story, mm -hmm. you know? It's a sort Wizard of story of Oz, structure. Alice in Wonderland. A right. little bit of Pinocchio in there. Yes, like, yes. Yeah. The sort of yes. the kid goes on the magical right. journey that may or may not be a dream and seems right. to reflect their internal life. But it's, like, also about that, like, penumbra between being a kid and being a grown up totally. where like you're still you can accept this world liminal states the best yes. kind of states right, right. Uh, but like you are getting ready to move beyond it like and to grow up mm -hmm. and like all the mm -hmm. fears of being boring and being you know set in your ways like or what you know and being bourgeois <laughs> like mm -hmm. basically right. right that are going to come with being a grown up you know and uh like all you know but like Whereas Disney movies are often about like childlike innocence, right? Fantasy world. Hold right. on to that forever. Right. right. This is yeah, about yeah, like yeah. a fantasy world that still requires you to build your character and yeah. work and like be part of a collective and like yeah, a yeah, society, yeah. right? Yeah. And where there are rules and uh -huh. uh, it's often incredibly unfair or frightening. Like you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <sighs> the world of adulthood. And look, as in with. As with every Miyazaki movie, there are no, like, out-and-out -out villains, uh, right. particularly. Like, Yubaba is not a villain. Well, it's, I mean, she's I mean, a that's another, boss. I mean, she has to deal with being a boss. Right, but at the end, she's like, wait, Shihiro is waving goodbye to Yubaba along with everybody else. 100%. You know, it's like, yeah. Well, and also, at the end, Yubaba does this thing that seems cruel, like, I will test you. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to pass my test. And I, f I think that this, the dub ignores this. But in the original version, she's like, you know, the baby's like, you can't do this. This is mean. Like, let her go. And Yubaba's like, these are the rules. I have to give her a right. test. It's in the contract. Yeah. Right. Like, the only way she gets her name back is if she passes the test. And it's like Yubaba's being like, she has to have grown up, like, a little bit. Right. If this place hasn't changed her, she's stuck here. You know, like, you know, she's only allowed to be free if she realizes something about it, herself. It, just it like Haku. Hollow. Right. Right. Uh, and so, like, it's not like Yubaba's like, I'm doing this because I'm embittered in me right right i'm doing it because i'm in charge of this thing right i i know you're the one who usually reads the miyazaki no quotes read the miyazaki quotes but there were a lot of interesting ones here in the wikipedia which yeah there are also in your mystical leather bound book it's fine it's but it said uh, i i created a heroine who is an ordinary girl someone with whom the audience can sympathize sympathize it's not a story in which the characters grow up but a story in which they draw on something already inside them brought out by the particular circumstances like that's a really interesting thing about the movie sure. is that it's not like she sort of um, uh, grows. Mm -hmm. It's that she sort of comes to a greater sense of understanding with who she is. Sure. You know? And it's going to be. And yeah. 
how the world is going to work for her and right. for everybody. And she's also in a context in the bathhouse and dealing with particular circumstances that 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 are, I would say, simultaneously allowing and demanding more of her. Yes. Whereas when we when we meet Shahiro in the back seat of the car, she's with these kind of like pretty lame parents. The parents are kind of lame, yet, distracted, kind of unresponsive. But like she's not a bad girl. She's no. just kind of like a, you know, a little whiny and right. sort of like what do I get? Like, you know, a little right. demanding. But what I what I one of the one of the 10 billion things I love about this movie is that she is not some special creature. Who is right, selected right, for the right. magic world because of her specialness? She's not Harry Potter. She doesn't arrive in spirit, yeah. the spirit land, and they're like, "It's you, the one we've who's been, been waiting, foretold. We've been waiting right. for you." She arrives, right. and they're like, "Well, you can scrub floors if you want, and also yeah. you smell bad, <laughs> and also right. you stink, and right. you're skinny and small. Right. You seem pretty useless, yeah. like right. honestly." And, and it also is a movie where, unlike um, those those other types of narratives, like Wizard of Oz or Alice in Wonderland, sure. whatever, Harry Potter, whatever, there's not the moment like. Things get fantastical while she's still with her parents and awake. There is yeah, no yeah. moment yeah, where yeah, she yeah. falls right. asleep where you can go, well, maybe that's the deniability point. Right. Or there's no moment where she falls down a hole and you're like, well, now who knows what happened? She conked her head. Right. Yeah, like they go into a magical portal. You know, they go into the mysterious tunnel. Right. But she does it with her parents. Right. And her parents and, are like, oh, yeah, this is like some old amusement park. Like, yeah. that's what this must be. I think the opening of this movie is so unsettling. And one thing that I was. Oh, it's very frightening. This is the, the. I couldn't show this movie to a little kid, I think. I think it's no. a little too intense. I think so. The, the opening. What happens to right. the parents. That whole concept. Well, there's right. that. But I was thinking of something, a really specific moment that I had forgotten. It's kind of like what you're talking about when you see something again. And you yeah. have like, I forgot about that. It's a really quick moment, but it's before they've even reached the tunnel and, and they're oh, but her the breeze? Are you talking her, about the breeze? Well, I'm talking about when her father's on okay. the dirt road and he's going fast mm-hmm. and they pass He brags a, about his four wheel drive. Oh, right. I know what you're talking about. They, right. they pass a um stone sculpture yes. yeah. with and a that, face on it. And and it's CG, so yes, it stylistically right. looks different. Very it's different. smoother and you track her Yes. Turning her head, I think, to watch it as yeah. it passes. And it's moving at a very different speed. Yeah, there's every, something so yes. um portentous about yeah. that about that moment yeah so it's, it's like right it's not like moment. the tornado picked the house up and then flew it away and right. then everything was different it is more it's like more gradual what you're talking about though is when, so i saw this film in theaters in um london england camden town odeon Grew up in England. Why? Because okay. it, was it released earlier there? Did you get on a plane in order to see it earlier? I'm Why? Would... Pretty sure it was released later. Nigel Smith's review, you say, is from 2003. So what, had you yeah, missed sep- it? September 2003. Yeah, I think it came out a lot later. What, what were you saying? So had you missed it in theaters in the United States? And right. took a no, I grew up in England. I was a high schooler. You knew about this? Well, I Is this the new bit that Ben knows? Yeah, I, f- <laughs> I feel like it's come up. I'm like, remember it. Not on this podcast. No, duh. What, on Night Cheese? No, no. It's come up before. It has not come up on this podcast. This is just like revisiting a a favorite dream. It's like, (laughs) oh my God, I'm back in my dream world. Um, And I remember not knowing what I was in for. I'd never seen a Miyazaki movie before. I was aware of him. Uh, I was aware of Mononoke, which had had a release here. You know, like I was aware that he was this respected Mm -hmm. creature. Mm Mm-hmm. And then that moment where you see, I'm like, oh, and like, it's like sent like a little chill up my yeah, spine. Yeah, it's really unsettling. And I was like, wait, so that's what's going to happen here? I yeah. think I expected probably just something more bonkers, right? Like something like trippy, quote unquote. Right. Like what an American uh, remake of Alice in Wonderland might be like, uh, well, directed by someone like Tim Burton. Sure. Uh, twisted. Um, but I also, like, I, my, I feel like weirdly a lot of the weight I was putting on this movie when I saw it was like, well, A, everyone's saying this is this masterpiece that's going to win the Oscar. Sure. And B, this is the highest grossing film in the history of Japan. Right. This is their blockbuster. Yeah, yeah that it had this this uh, Titanic Slayer reputation. Right, right. right. And very often the like, highest grossing film of any country is incredibly accessible. Sure. And right. sort of like stripped down fundamental – like story basics, audience satisfying. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. That to see this movie and be like, wait, what? Th- the entire like country is. You're like Japanese people think this is normal, <laughs> right? Right. But like this is like the most accessible, like in the middle, everyone can come to this. Right. Movie. This is this is the four quadrant hit. Right. Right. That's the thing. Yeah. Not that like you know the the level of quality, but like this is something that everyone is able to get in on. Yes. Was, right. Was very odd because yes. It starts with two boring parents in a car. 
spends very little time before it gets to them finding an abandoned amusement park. Yes. And then her parents become grotesques who can't stop eating. <laughs> And there's yes. no like, and the food looks so good too. Oh my you God. fully right. understand. But oh there's my, no yeah. moment of reality me? break, you know, which no. is the scariest thing. I feel like if you're a child talking about not wanting to show this to an actual young like child. like to a very young child, right? The right. scariest thing is just like my parents will stop paying attention to me, and then you'll and then be you'll be a, alone. I will right. end up in a world that's indifferent to me that asks me. Just that sort of build too, where it's right. like first her parents are just sort of ignoring her, and she's in a bad mood. She's yeah. moving, and kids often will know. I knew that I had moved when I was nine. Like, shut up. Where? That uh, um, that sort of. You I'm think pretty, that, I'm pretty sure. Really, I'm pretty sure. That kind of that pain out. of like I've been like ripped from my school and it's right, so sure. traumatic, right. and all that, you know, right? Um, and then like the parents turn into pigs. That's bad. Right. Really bad. Now she's alone in this place. Right. Yeah. All these like weird ghosts and creatures start showing up and walking around. The lights come on, which is kind of wonderful. Oh, but also, also she starts to literally disappear. She starts to literally through. disappear. Right. Then a kid shows up. Haku, another right. boy, a boy her age shows up, and you're like, okay, all right, here's her friend, and he does the thing where he. He blows the little petals, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, "What?" Like that's where I would get so frightened. Like, what? What, what are the rules of this? Right. What, what did he just do? Right. Never explain, right. right? Whatever that is, right? Very. It's presented as this very pivotal thing that he's doing, mm -hmm. and you expect him later to be like, "Well, because of the petal spell, right, you'll right. be you'll be safe now." I, right, I yeah. think that's where literal minded thirteen year old Griffin is just like, "I don't get this movie." Yeah. What are the rules of this? Yeah, this right. is, Someone what, explain what is this? to me. Well, no one right. ever says like. So this is the spirit world. Right. It's where you go and you die, or it's where right. the creatures of elemental being, you know, ele elemental existence are. Right. No one says anything like that. The only thing Ubaba says is like, this is where spirits come to fucking relax. Right. right. That's it. It is also such an unnerving thing to be like, oh, it's an abandoned amusement park. Yeah, I hear there are a lot of these. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, as a Westerner, you have a almost like a double displacement. Or actually, it's a triple displacement, because think about it. First of all, you're watching a movie that's from a pretty different culture. Uh -huh. Like a, 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 for a modern society, Japanese culture is like really different from American culture. And a culture – Even though it had become so westernized. Right, right. In, right. But like, it's still – I mean this right. stuff goes back thousands of years. So first of all, basic, you're watching a Japanese movie. Right. A, a culture where the basic relationship to life and death is so fundamentally different than how we perceive it. Right. Or, or, or where – or how you um, uh, interpret – the, the relationship between the spiritual world and the, yes. and the natural world, all that stuff. So already you have that. Then within that culture, you are in an amusement park, <laughs> right. which is a kind of weird – Like a facsimile. A weird of a, space of a within a right, space. Right, right, right. Oh, and also it's not just an amusement park. It's an abandoned amusement park. Yeah. So now there's a third displacement, and that's even before you cross the river and now you're in a bathhouse for gods and spirits. <laughs> So I mean, like even the baseline yeah. of where of where we as Westerners enter this movie is like the ground is shifting under our feet. Like, like I saw what happened to Kiss. Yeah, it right. wasn't good. Yeah, like all right, I like I'm making my way in Japan. Oh, I guess I'm in an aban uh, abandoned amusement park in Japan. Right. Like this is a lot. Okay, well, and also as far as I know, Japan had this incredibly crippling recession in the early nineties, right. which I feel like that's sort of in reference. That's to, what right? the like, amusement like, parks are. There were a lot. Yeah, right. It's like a ghost town. Right. right. And, like the lost decade. They like right. they call it. and sure. like. So maybe that's sort of in reference to that is like, yeah, our country kind of had this frenzy of construction and like mm -hmm. innovation and stuff. So, well, and right. like, so that, that whole opening all these remnants thing, right. of it. And what's our connection to the actual country we're part of? That's right. what that's what the that's what setting all that stuff is. Right. I mean, that this is actually like one of the most accessible parts of the movie because it's political, which is Miyazaki being like Japan guys like what? What happened? Yeah. Like here you're driving around in your Audi car. You're wearing your golf shirt, bragging about <laughs> your credit cards. drive, right? Yeah. Credit cards. Yes. You don't care about your kids. You're alienated from your own children now because you're moving for a new job. You're stuffing your face. You know, you're, yeah. you're turning into a pig. And the context in which this is happening is this, is this place, this artificial world that was built before a bubble collapsed. And now it's just been left to ruin. Oh, and they also destroyed a beautiful river. To make this thing that is now derelict. Well, also the fact that like an amusement park is like here is an incredibly controlled artificial environment that has been created just to make children happy. Right. right. You know? For no like sort of betterment or – Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like an amusement park for, for like a child is like this is a world with like bumpers everywhere. Everything is made to like entertain you for your enjoyment and it's completely safe and controlled and secure. Sure. 
that to right. then be like this is like the hollowed out husk of an amusement park where there is no joy, nothing is operating. Right. It's like watching like a, a it's like watch like looking at a physical manifestation of a dead childhood. Well, that's why abandoned, and she's so abandoned, freaked abandoned, out. Abandoned amusement parks are. That's why they're creepy. Yeah, yes. they are right? creepy. And I always think of Chernobyl too. You know, pri- mm-hmm. uh, Pripyat or where the the, the abandoned uh, right. Ferris wheel there. Oh, and also there's all these shadows that are like starting to show up in the stalls around. I mean, it's a lot. Because so going first, on. chill up my spine moment is the weird statue. Yeah. Right. Second, chill up my spine moment is when she's standing in the tunnel and her parents are going forward, and she's like. She has that childish thing of like, I'm not right, moving. Right, right, right. Yeah. This is just not good. I don't like what you're doing, and so I'm going to fucking plant my feet right, right here. Right. And then there's that wind yeah, that blows yeah, behind yeah. Pushes her. Yeah, pushes her through. And she has that other childish feeling you have where you're like, something ain't right. right. My parents yeah. tell me that ghosts don't exist right, and right. that creepy stuff doesn't happen. But she runs but catch I got up it. with her right, mom. Right. And, uh, and right, she, she's not mean to anyone. Mm-hmm. She doesn't take someone's toys. But Miyazaki's just kind of communicating, like, this is a person who, this is an adolescent who is just not ready for anything, you know what I mean? And who can't really, like, is, right. is spoiled, quote but unquote he's spoiled. he's not setting up a didactic, like, this is the lesson She's she not a bad girl learn. who needs to learn how to be a good girl. Like, no, she's not the one who turned into a pig because of her selfishness. She doesn't turn into a pig. Right. Because of her selfishness. Right. Right. Um... Spirited so, away. Haku blows petals on her face. Haku blows some petals, no, into the air, not on her face. Oh, okay. Uh, and then tries to sneak her in over the bridge by having her hold her breath. Right. But then she takes a breath because she sees a frog man. A little right. frog says like, hey, Haku, what's up? So Haku like turns him into a bubble. Right. And then like runs and suddenly right. like the colors are all running and right. And yeah. But and then he's got to sneak her in. She apologizes profusely and he's right. like, it's fine. You did a good job. Yeah. Right. Right. You held on for pretty, pretty long. Yeah. He's not like, fuck. Right, there's no conflict. But Haku is this changeable creature, which I think is supposed to refer... I mean, for one, he's been enslaved. He's got, like... He's got a black slug inside A black him. slug inside mm-hmm. his body. But, right. dude, he's like a river. He should As be, do we all. Right, exactly. We right. really do. Yeah. But, like, he's supposed to be kind of changeable and unpredictable mm-hmm. and moody mm-hmm. and, like, placid at one point and sort of strong. Right. He's a river. Spoilers. Right. Right. Spoiler alert, he's a river. And Sorry. as you say, he's I think the idea is that right, they sort of paved over a river mm-hmm. or dammed a river, right? Like right. To, well her, her dad says this used to be a river. Right. 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 Uh, that energy she, had to go somewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. And she lost right. her shoe in mm-hmm. it a mm-hmm. long time ago, which yeah. is sort of what like maybe bonds them together. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty good. I'm getting really emotional just <laughs> thinking about it. I right mean, now. the, 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 the scene when she's flying on his back and she realizes she, yeah. his expression. Right. And the scales literally fall off it's his like, eyes. Yeah. It's so intense. And then, and they're then, they're then they land together. in absolute yeah. silence. Yes. They're falling together yeah. and she says, like, she's crying. I mean, yeah, we're yeah, getting yeah. to the end here, but we might as well just yeah. talk about it right this oh, second. Oh, it's incredible. It's and, so and he, incredible. He, I believe, says, or is it her? One of them says, I'm so happy. Like, you know, that's the final yeah, line right. of their conversation. Every time I watch this movie, I start, like, sobbing, like, hacking sobs. It is yeah. Even if I haven't been emotional for the rest of the movie. Right, right. Because uh, I, I go to happens see to me this. every single time. Yeah. It is somewhat Pavlovian, I think, because I've seen sure. it so many times. But, I see like, this with my mother when I'm 13, and when that happens, I go, he's a fucking river? What is this movie? Like, that <laughs> He's was, clearly a person. Like, that right. was the moment for me that I remember being like, I, I have no way into this. Right. Like, I don't understand yeah, what's going on You brought on it here. up in the past. It's sort of right. like, that was your, your Miyazaki barrier. I was, was like, like, I'm I don't done. He's a I'm river? done. I'm not, I'm not going to try to fight this. Uh, but uh, last night, I was like, well, this is the most obvious, innate, organic thing like right. of course of course he's the river you know yeah uh and just even hearing you uh just recount him yeah yeah i got chills well it's i mean again it really it can depend on where you're at in your life or it can depend on where you're at in your head in the moment but these things that are just like you can be in a mood where you're like that doesn't make any sense or you can be in a mood of ecstasy like i'm having an <laughs> ecstatic experience right now right this is this is profound right, right? like this kid is the spirit of the river like they met a long time ago and now he's going to stop being a dragon and they're just going to float down God, together it's just like again, just you know what i mean though it's just yeah, like yes, yes and that's the kind of thing where as a westerner again i'm like is this like just another day in the life of japanese pop culture right, do or, they see or, one of these every or, day <laughs> or, or is this like something true like or is this the sistine chapel right you know like a total out of the park home run where People are just like, how did he do that? How did he access that? How did he 
create this thing that feels so specific and so universal at the same time, which I think is a tension yeah. that runs throughout the movie the entire run of the movie, which is why the whole thing is so exciting. It also speaks to, though, how almost all movies could afford to explain less. Yeah. Like when Absolutely. you watch a film yeah, that, totally. that is this totally. much a product of a culture that you don't understand right. and you surrender yourself to, there are things I'm not going to get because I grew right. up in fucking New York City. You enjoy it in a totally different <laughs> level. Like even like a movie that is not anywhere near as dense, but The Farewell. What fantastic, wonderful, beautiful movie. Right. I sit there watching the film and trying to understand the relation of the family. And the yeah, movie, sure, right. There's a little of that to sort of puzzle out. It's like you, if no one that just sits down and is like, I am his brother and I moved to Japan and these are my children. Right, you right. Know, right. I'm right. like, right. okay, there's, a, there's an uncle and there's a cousin yeah, and there's yeah, yeah. a grandmother. Right, right. And they like, all live in different places and they all have different... You kind of have to context clue piece together over sure. the course of an hour and a half. Like, okay, she's the mother of the two of them. Right. And that's what right. happened here. And it's so much more satisfying to yes. have a movie force you to sort of work for it and with it in that kind of 100%. way. Well, the the feeling I remember most specifically and most strongly about seeing Spirited Away for the first time, which I think I saw in the, in the theater, because I'd seen Princess Mononoke on videotape uh -huh. and heard about this new one and was like, we'll go see it. Sure. I remember just the the procession. It's just one of the... It's one and of the many, greatest music here, too. One of the many great just locked off side shots in this movie just when the when the, the spirits are floating when, you mean? well there well there's that but when right. then the side then there's just the side view of the bridge and this procession of all these mm -hmm. different spirits and gods coming to the bathhouse and then it's just like you're like okay what are are these are these re known religious sure. icons sure. Right, right. or are these just goofy cartoon characters and then that feeling continues because then when you're down in the boiler room and you see the soot balls yeah you're like well, they, Miyazaki must have made this up. This is just too cute. Like, this can't be some real, you know. Throughout the movie, you have Miyazaki's own creations. Then you have, obviously, there's probably all different types of visualizations. But you have actual spirits that are part of a millennia-old right, folk culture yes, and, right. and religious culture. Mm -hmm. And then you have original characters like, like Yubaba. <laughs> Right. Or, right, or the frog. Oh, and then you got three green bouncing heads that <laughs> function as an assistant to, to you, Baba. Baba. And so the way they open it, doors is, how it always, always gets They're my favorite character. Watching it, it's so exciting and overwhelming, not only because there's just so much going on visually, but because it does feel like a pastiche of, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it feels like a pastiche of things that are thousands of years old. Yeah. Things that were made up two years ago at Studio Ghibli. Right. Standard human characters mm -hmm. and you, but you have no for us it would be like you go to see a, a new cartoon and the main characters are santa claus right jesus christ <laughs> uh beyonce you know and a coffee grinder right and they all live in this world and interact with each other yes and we would be like well that's a lot of, that's a lot of like a lot going on here yeah. that's a little, yeah. lot to wrap my head around you know, so that's how you feel watching it when you're talking about not knowing exactly like, mm -hmm. like, like right. Superman and Moses. Are yeah, but I mean, you know, and it's kind of like that. And that's what makes it kind of that's, I think, what contributes to this feeling of just like feeling overwhelmed, you know, I also, and also yes. that also serves that kind of dream logic that it has, because in a dream, you can a dreams can be populated with people or creatures or stuff that would have no business interacting in the real world. They're from separate worlds, you know, whether it's like a dream where you're like, hey, I was with my uncle, but he was also my high school teacher, but right, right, they never right. met, you know, it's like that yeah. type of stuff. Absolutely. Right. And I was in my house, but it had other rooms, right, that were right. other places that right. I've accessed in my life. And sometimes your memory is a vibe. It's a feeling. It's right. not actually like contextual it's an stuff. Emotion, it's maybe. an emotion. Right. Yeah. 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 For, for me also, it is like uh, the thing I was thinking about and I was like, that's the reason this has endured for so long because it taps into this quality and they have over decades not been able to recapture this. The first fucking 20 minutes of Star Wars, when you're starting in media res with R2-D2 and C-3PO, these two low status characters, one of whom can't talk and the movie is throwing – so much shit at you. Right. And all you understand is that these characters are vulnerable. 
Right. But you can't understand the power structures. You don't understand the rules of the universe, and it keeps on throwing more stuff at you. And some of the stuff is understandable as, like, these are archetypes, right? right? Oh, these things are behaving like this. I can sort of map on this behavior. But watching that first chunk of the movie, which then that film becomes plottier, and the other films become plottier, and the prequels become super didactic, and the Disney films come about trying to recapture that feeling, but in a more controlled way. That feeling watching the opening of Star Wars where you're just like, this guy's got this whole thing figured out and he's only telling me 2% of it. Right, yeah. And Which he's is, just trusting that I'll understand. And there's such a fine line and I guess it's I guess it's like – helps you decide whether someone is a great artist or not, which is that the feeling of you, you want to feel comfort. You want to feel that the person is lead. You want to be led somewhere and you yeah. want to be led by somebody who knows where they're going. Right. You don't want it to feel, um, unconfident or something like that. It, it is. It does break down but, into but confidence. It, right. But I think sometimes confidence these days, maybe this gets back to my thesis about entertainment weekly and story structure. Uh -huh. So many times now, we associate confidence with with a storyteller saying, I know exactly what's going on. Here is what's going on. Here is what is right. going to happen. I need to hit these marks. Hit, 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 boom. I have achieved total storytelling competence. Right. Thank you for this journey. But that's the but, thing. It's, but, it's competence and not confidence. It's a knowingness. Right. It's like a self-awareness Right. rather than that confidence of like, I think people will understand this. Right. Which is like you associate with like David Lynch's better works. Yes. Where he's like, I'm not telling you shit, but I know I know what's going on. Like, <laughs> Right. That's the thing. Right. Like you can tell when the person who's made something knows the answers. The Twin Peaks show did have that quality. The, 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 the third season. I mean all of Twin Peaks. But right. the third season where it's like she's entering a mystical boiler room. Like, and it's like I, I'm, I was just very much like I cannot imagine trying to – logically map what's going on sure. i understand the emotions of what's happening right you know what yeah, i mean yeah. like but i don't want to think about like who the boiler represents but right. i know, what, yeah, you know, yeah. like, I know yeah, that yeah. he has answers sure i also think all the best actors have that quality where you're like they're kind of only giving me 10 percent of what they could possibly do mm -hmm. but it's not because they're being lazy it's because they want you to work for being like why aren't they giving me the rest right. well and also that's how humans are right i mean humans are only going to give you right so much but right? de niro is like an incredibly bottled actor because his whole thing is like watching him and being like, "There's, there's something else something that this guy not telling isn't me. doing." Right. right? Maybe I tell you. Yeah. He what do you like Trump? That's that's the secret. Right. Ding dong. I'm getting the door. A creak. Oh, oh, what's in the box? Oh, for crying out loud! Detective Mills from Seven. What's in the box? Are you, that's your name. Or you're asking me. My name is Detective Mills from the film 7, directed by David Fincher. What's in the box, David? Well, are you talking about Bespoke Post? Yeah, the box looks awesome. A box of What's awesome? What's in the box? All right. Calm down. Is it a head? Don't tell me. Don't tell me it's Gwyneth Paltrow's head. No, 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 no. No, no, Not no, no. Not seeing. So, so uh, we look, you're talking about boxes of awesome, which come from Bespoke Post every month. Yeah. This guy's out. Not from John Doe. They come from Bespoke Post. Yeah, they go out scouting for quality and unique products to send in every box. And they don't go scouting for your fiance. If you go to boxofawesome.com, you can, you know, answer some short questions and help oh, them get a feel no. for the kind of boxes that'll best go with your style. Oh, no, I'm worried. Um, so looking at the boxes now, I'm on bespokepost.com. Okay. Yeah. I'm not seeing any nope. heads. I'm seeing a frying pan with a sous chef box. Oh, that this. sounds good. That one looks good. Uh, I'd love to learn how to Look cook. At this. You got a little pepper grinder? Oh, man. I love to spice my dishes. Uh, you know, I mean, I just got the carry one, uh, which is a little, uh, you know, um, little wallet-y thing for your cards. Oh. Comes with a cool little pen. Oh, man. Retired For signing dip. receipts. Oh, man. That pen's probably really high quality, made of really strong, durable what did materials. You get? What, was, what did you recently get? You're asking me, Griffin Newman? Yeah. Uh, sorry, Detective Mills. Uh, what I recently get, I've been doubling down on, they have a lot of uh, drink adjacent. Did you, get, did you get that alchemy box? I, I believe I got the alchemy box this yeah, time. Got, I previously got, got, there was like and... a holiday box that had a little fun. Because there's another important point. Uh, they're, they're constantly cycling yeah, they out change new boxes. Up. Yeah, I've gotten some good boxes from the boxes of awesome. Whether you're in search of the perfect drink, well-kept pad, jet-setting in style, bespoke post can improve your life one box at a time. I'm going to open Detective Mills' box. With the knife that Ben got from a previous box. Okay? See, I'm using the items from the box. So let me just... Crack. David, take a look. What's in the box? It's, it's, 
It's the lather box. It's the lather it's box. It's got a bunch of shaving stuff. It's in got a, a little in a little bag. Bowl and cream. It's got a little brushes. Dave, it was in the bag. All right, enough. Each box goes for under fifty bucks, but has more than seventy dollars worth of unique gear waiting inside for you. Okay. Okay. First of each month, you get an email with your box details. You've got five days. You can change colors or sizes. You can add goods. If you're not feeling that month's box, you can skip it. And uh, it's got all kinds of essential goods and guidance for the modern man. So listen. You listening? I'm listening. I felt, I feel called to. Okay, fine. To receive 20% off your first subscription box, go to boxofawesome.com and enter code CHECK at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, code CHECK for 20% off your first box. It's bespoke post theme boxes for guys that give a damn. I like what's in this box. I like the box, David. Okay, okay. Spirited away. Yes. Yeah, so she's at the bathhouse. She's uh, Haku sneaks her in mm-hmm. and is like, you have to ask for a job. They can't yeah. turn you down. That's the only way you're going to survive. The rules of this place is that you you're, must be given employment. And we've already been given so many rules that she's been – well, I guess the first rule was get across the river before the sun goes down. She yes. didn't do, the second one was hold your breath going across the bridge. So you're already thinking like, is that a known thing? Mm-hmm. Is that like a trope in right, Japanese sure. folklore sure. or is that just is it like up? not stepping on a crack? Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Um. So go get see. A, go get a job. You have to get a job. Go see Kamaji. Right. right. They, so they she give goes, her Shana Na advice. Get a job. That's right. Um, and Kamaji is uh, a yokai, mm-hmm. uh, which is a a sort of phantom. I don't mm-hmm. know how else to describe it. Uh, like he's got four arms. Like he's unusual looking. Yeah. He's a spider guy. He's pretty cool. Well, he's a spider he's man with a walrus mustache. Yeah. Um, he lives the in the boiler room. Yeah. Uh, he's animated the soot to do work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he feeds them with little starfish uh, cookies, <laughs> right? Uh, right? Yeah, where again, you're like... <laughs> little star cookies. Is this candy that came in a plastic bag? <laughs> right. Like, what is this? It looks so bright. Is this children's cereal or is this, like, ancient... He, yeah. He has forearms. And, he has and they're six. Six. Like, yeah. real taut muscles. Uh, he can stretch yeah. them as much as he can to yeah. the infinite shelves of right. herbs that he has. Right. For, right. Um, he... I... I, I I mean, this, I think, is when I was just like, I think this, I love this. Like, yeah. you know, right? Like, when you're watching it the first time, you're like, I understand I understand the logic of everything, mm-hmm. even though I've never seen anything like this before. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. the logic of her being like, see, I can help, and she only just dis- hurts. Right. She's like, I'll do what the soot creatures do. And he's like, this right. is not your, this isn't your zone. Well, also, he says, you're can, useless. But he also says something really interesting, which is like, it's inappropriate to take someone's job. Yeah, right, Something right. Like he's that. like, the soot creatures right. do this. And right. also, like, her trying to enter the soot ecosystem right. leads to them all, like, going on a weird little strike where they suddenly drop the coal on each other. Hey, man, themselves. she's a disruptor. Sure. Right. Right. right? She's a disruptor. But she's bad at it. She can't pick up the coal. It's really heavy. It's surprisingly very heavy. heavy for her. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I feel like the soot scene is like, are you in or are you out? Like this yeah. is it, right? Yeah. Right. Like, uh, come on, guys, talk about the soot right. scene. Last night I was a thousand percent in. <laughs> Good, great. I, I mean, honestly, just from the emergence of Mister Arms. Uh, right, Kamaji. Right, right. Yeah. And, and seeing a character who is, I guess, back to the same thing that this character is very confident. That he's so confident understanding the rules of the world. Right. How he needs to operate, what she needs to do, what everyone needs to do. Mm -hmm. There's something kind of infectious about, like, as opposed to, like, Haku, who's been like, ah, fuck. Um, Okay, let's try this. Hold your breath. And who's a human? Whereas Kamaji seems like a piece of machinery that is animate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, he performs a servant. But then you find out later what he's doing. The reveal of then how he is like setting right. up the bath, sure, the sure. Water like the tags come down, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That they he's set running that the up. he's running the bath. He's the CPU for the bathhouse, yeah. right, 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 yeah. right. Oh, yeah. But also that he is in perpetual motion, like right, he right, is right. trying to help her, trying to discern what she he's can grinding, do, giving her advice. He's turning. He never stops doing his job, right. and it's like. You know, it's so – the confidence of him being like, I can keep doing what I need to do and also take care of this. Right. Girl. Taking care of these soot creatures, taking care of these uh, – this little girl, getting work done, getting paid. Right. And then Lynn shows up. Lynn, who is like the friend, mm-hmm. right? The boss, you know what's the interesting? Sister. Watching this movie a couple days ago, I've probably seen this movie almost as, me- as many times as any other movie Me I've too. ever seen, which Me is too. to say four times. Because I don't really, I don't really rewatch don't movies. You rewatch a lot, right? Yeah. But um, and I hadn't seen it. The last time I saw it was with an ex girlfriend and her two children, one of whom was too young and really freaked the fuck out. Sure. Mm-hmm. But um, 
I had completely forgotten about the character of Lynn. Oh, really? It was actually a really charming. Yeah, and you could she's a little bit of a sort of thing to hold character. on to. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. All of this. But but in my memory of the movie, it, I mean, I remembered all the other principal characters uh, except for Lynn. Maybe because she's the only. Is she human? She's not, right? No. She doesn't look as sluggish as the other slug right. women. She is not human because Shihiro is human, and right, they all remark right, on that right. she smells like a human. Yeah, okay. She's humanoid. Right. Lynn she is the most well. human. Right. She is the most. She looks human. Yeah. But right. She is. I have to assume a person who died. I don't really. If I wanted to delve into the logic of what this spirit world is, right. where you're dealing with these elemental creatures, because like. He's drawing from all these Shinto beliefs of like right. there are spirits everywhere in the right, world. Right, right. There are spirits in the air. There are plants, you know, right? right? So like that's who some of these things are. But then like the humans, you're sort of like, are these right? Are these people who died and have moved into the spirit world? Well, were I they always in the spirit world? The male you know, attendants are they're frog, frog men. They're little men. And, right. and the female attendants are slugs. Right. Right. But Lynn. But Lynn and some, uh, there are some human okay, people, right. right? I don't know. I, I, but Lynn is very clear, like, you're a human and you stink. Right, yeah, okay, you're And right. she eats a newt. Like, one of the right. first things she does is eats a that fried, fried newt, yeah. which is not something that uh, I would do, hmm. whereas she's, like, really into it. Yeah, right. That's true. So, she's not human. But she does read as, if you're... But if, she is human. I mean, right. she's humanoid, like I said. Right. What do you read? What do I'm going to read something that only makes this more confusing. Okay. This is from the Ghibli Wiki, but they're uh, quoting the Art of Spirited Away book. Sure. Okay? Lin is portrayed as a human being in the film. In the Japanese picture book, Lin is described as Bayako, a white tiger. Okay. Cool. That, that's all you got? Yeah, but they, they identify her as just spirit as species here. Right. right. She is a spirit. Right. Because I guess everyone is a spirit. That's the right. key yeah, distinction yeah, yeah. is that right. perhaps she's a human spirit. Whereas the others are are not, um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But there we see a couple other humans, right. human, like mm-hmm. in, in when where they where she sleeps, yeah. you know, where they have their aprons in there. But she is certainly the most normal central character in this film. She's an archetype we fully understand. She's like the older sister who's like, right, oh, God, right. Oh, I have hero, to drag you around, clots. right. But in the end, deal with nice. this. hold your hand through everything, right. right. But she is helpful, and she, you know, uh, Kamaji kind of bribes her into, like, take this new, take her to fucking Yubaba. Take her upstairs. And they, again, they're like, you must, you cannot back down. You must ask for work. Get a job. Get a job. Exactly. Uh-huh. You have to become part of the economy. You have to be, and there is this weird economy. If you economy. ever want to escape childhood, you must become a productive member of this economy. Right. Yes. Right. Right. You have to scrub. Right. right. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the free ride's over. Mm-hmm. you got to be contributing something. Right. You can't just bum around in here. Yeah. Right. Which is one thing that I feel like we'll get to No Face, but why he's so disruptive. Like, No Face is not part mm-hmm. of how the, all the, the capitalist sort of collective balances at work here. I'm still here. getting chills talking about all this. Like, I think I'm going to rewatch this movie again. Tonight. I highly recommend it. As someone yeah. who's seen this movie a million times, it's pretty much always kind of rewarding. Yeah. Even if you don't, even if you want to kind of just have it on and sort of soak in it, and not like think about it too hard, right? right? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. it's rewarding in every way. Yeah, it's rewarding in sort of like really concentrating and thinking about every single choice that's being made. Mm-hmm. I mean, like when she enters the bathhouse, it's so beautiful, it's so scary. Right. It is yeah, that yeah. kid feeling of yeah, like yeah. I don't know the rules of this place. Right. Yeah, There's yeah, all yeah. these grown ups and all right. these right, but they're just also are like frogs and a radish spirit. Right. This this was his most can't even can't even talk about that shot of her squeezed up against the inside of the oh. elevator at the rabbit the rabbit Radish. spear and he has those tendrils coming off his breasts and it's just like so uncomfortable. But also he's nice. You know he's that thing when you're well, a kid you're so afraid. They're all right. they're all, I mean and this but he some, like bows to her and she's like okay, right right yes right. yeah I have to yeah, be he's polite, polite. Right. right yeah yeah, yeah. 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 the spirits aren't like monsters by and large right. they are benevolent they're right. nice. Wait, uh, what were we going to say, Griffin? No, I was going to say a couple things. The Radish Spirit has BBE. Definitely Big Ben energy. <laughs> Feels like, like a real Ben spirit? character. Hell yeah. Um, but but also, uh, th- this I think was his most expensive film uh, sure. at the time. Right. And I mean, Mononoke had been a game-changing sensation. Right. You can, yeah, right. Right, so he had a bit of a blank check, and because his um, stature had risen so much, he knew he was going to have to use more CGI for the film. Knew it was going to be a production. He said his original script was three hours long. And so he was like, I have to – this is insane, okay? 
his quote was, in order to get to a manageable length, I had to cut out all the eye candy. In his mind, this is That's a version so of boring. the movie. That's why it looks so boring. I'm sorry the it's film is like, so flat and colorless. Yeah, show me something I haven't seen a million times, why don't you? Right, he cut it down just to a the sort of... A radish spirit on an elevator, The maybe? stock shit right. we've seen a thousand times right. before. Um, I mean, that's just like, act two. You got your radish spirit. Yeah. That, like, we're the building blocks of Hollywood story. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. There you go. Yeah. Hollywood insider. Right. Meeting with the goddess, fat vegetable in an elevator. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and and you and you're watching Lynn again, like same thing with Haku, like antagonistic to you sometimes, but then you watch them be altruistic mm-hmm. yeah. in your, you know, she she eats the, you know, she sort of gets her through with the newt, right? What, what I was gonna say is there are so many characters in this film, primary characters who are so detailed, and the more detail you have in a basic character, obviously the more of a nightmare it is to animate in multiple scenes, right? Especially in extreme motion. It's the reason why most cartoon designs are very simplistic. Uh, you know, Charlie Brown is sort of like a platonic ideal for a cartoonist mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because it's like it's just a ball. It's a sphere and it's right. got a couple dots and lines on it right. and it's easy to draw him from any angle. But like um, – uh, what's her name? I keep on wanting to say Baba Yaga because I'm a moron. Yubaba. Yubaba is just like the first moment she appears on screen and you're like he's going to really – he's going to – challenge himself to keep animating this character right. for the next 90 minutes with that wrinkle structure on her face. There's that one scene very late in the film with Zaniba where just her nose is sort of hovering in the, yeah. In the frame. Yeah. And you're like, right, there's no logical way to not have that nose because it's so large. Right, but right. also the work you have to do to be like, I need to fully figure out how this nose looks in three dimensions. Here are all the wrinkles and like like right. lines of this nose, and I need to know how to animate it within space and movement. Also, just so it's not too easy, let's give her a ton of jewelry. Right, like everything yeah, about that her. Yeah, right. and right, and her proportions right. are right. completely illogical. Right. right. So They're, this was the first one where they sold the rights to Disney before production in order to get financing to help complete the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, that was like a big thing where once he had like cracked it, it was like this is going to be really expensive. We're going to need some more money. We need outside fundings. I think they sold to other countries as well. But that Lassiter, Lotso Hug and Lassiter, went to Disney and said like can we please – Right, Lassiter, Lotso Hug and Lassiter, Don Lassiter yeah. who's recently been disgraced. Oh, yeah. is that the, the Pixar guy? Yeah, yeah. but he right. was such a fan of uh, right. Miyazaki. So many people were. Yes. Uh, as I said, I think uh, Clements and Musker. Yes. We're heavily inspired by Cagliostro right. for uh, the Great Mouse Detective, things like that. Right. right. He's like, you don't understand. This is like, this is the guy. Like, we have to like. And I think he, he sold to them the idea that like it, every other country is starting to get really into this guy's movies. There should be a breakthrough moment where he connects with American audiences as well. And when the movie came out and it got sort of a half-hearted release, Disney's defense was, well, we didn't get merchandising rights, so we were really limited in what we could do with the film. Like their whole thing was that they could only make money off of releasing the movie in theaters. And the fact that they didn't retain the intellectual property of the film gave them so little incentive to do anything with it. Oh, I see. Because they couldn't make like no face dolls or something. Right, because right. he had those rights. Right. They couldn't he work on the rights. theme parks. Right. Right. It's all right. And all right. there's this Disney thing with how vertically integrated Disney is, especially now that they buy like more and more brands and just go like we can work everything into every tendril of our company. Where they were like, so what's what's the deal here? We put it in theaters and we just make money from people buying tickets. You mean that right. like successful business model that's existed for a hundred right. years? We can't where put like... it on Broadway. We <laughs> right, can't right, do right. an ice skating show. Oh like... my god, the Spirited Away Broadway show. Yeah, the musical <laughs> it kills uh, everyone who attends, right. <laughs> and they enter the spirit world. Um, the stink monsters coming closer and yeah. closer. Cover your nose. Ooh. Right. But so, I, okay, I just ahead. no, I just like I feel like honestly a reason why he had to put he had to go to Disney to get money to make the film is, is how because, incredibly hard it would be to create a character like you, Baba. Like and the, how many characters the there are power. like that? Right. There there are like multiple that are just right. like absurdly detailed. Right. Yubaba has a sister, though. Oh, okay, Jesus. What does she look like? She looks like Yubaba. Yeah, they did say there was one pretty cool cost-saving measure, <laughs> right. which is they're just going to look exactly yeah, the same. Right. It's not even a mirror. <laughs> right. um, Yubaba. Mm-hmm. Shows up to Yubaba. Yeah. I think we ex- – I don't know what – you know, another thing, right? I've never seen anything look like this. Yes. What an incredible-looking creature this is. Right. Um, She's living in a European – 
Yes. Aesthetic. A hundred percent. Right. Yes. Yeah. Very gothic. Very, uh, you know, she, crenellated. She almost looks <laughs> Lots like. Lots of books and rugs. And, right. She looks like a political cartoon. Like you're like, this is a caricature of a, a government official that I don't know. But it's. All, sure. You know? I get. I totally get that. But it's also like. How when you're a kid, you're kind of afraid of old people. Yep, totally. Because they just don't look right. They look different that to big the regular humans. in the middle of her head. Oh, yeah, God. right. Yeah. Where these things you focus on. Yeah. And, right, uh, yeah. yeah so, you get fixated on your great aunt's mole yeah, or something. Yeah, so she's kind yeah. of like your How grandma that you're afraid yeah. of. Yeah. Um, and she's like, get out of here. How'd you get up here? And yeah. she's like, I need a job. Get out of here. I need a job. I, you know. Yeah. And then the baby shows up. Which is just like, I mean, that's, at this point, you know, I don't know how many. For, for me, that's my boiler room where it's like, I guess we're doing this. Yeah. Like, yeah. like a giant a baby's giant foot baby. kicks a yeah. door down. Right. Exactly. And she immediately shifts from being scary grandma to being like, oh, calm right. down, baby. It's okay. Right. You know. But also such an interesting choice to like set up this character who's ostensibly sort of, if not the villain, the conflict. Right. Yeah, sure. The yeah. antagonist. And within different. like two minutes be like, oh, but she's like a really, really doting parent. To right. this she's, giant baby. she's, you know, her flaw is maybe a little too hard on the workers, a little too easy on the kid. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, like maybe yeah, she yeah. could find some balance in both. But there's that thing that even as a 14 year old or however old it was when I saw this movie, 16, where she writes Chihiro's name on the contract. That's so And then dope. lifts yeah, three of the yeah, kanji yeah, yeah, yeah. off. Right, and there's only yeah, yeah. one remaining. And right. she has a Same. totally different sounding name. Yeah. Right. And I think. I looked up the meanings of these words. Chihiro means, ah, oh, fuck, I have to look it up again because I want, Sen means a thousand. Right. Right. Um, and Chihiro means something like a thousand somethings. Let's find it. Chihiro Ogino. So she changed her name to a number, essentially. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, a thousand fathoms is right. what Chihiro wow. means. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone's like, Chihiro, that's a good name. Anytime they hear the name, right. her real name, they're like, oh, yeah. But just that concept that, like, she has your name now, so mm-hmm. you cannot escape. It's gone. It's not even like she, like, changed your name legally. It's like, that belongs to her. Right. There's nothing you can do with right. that. Yeah. And she'll start to, and she starts to forget it, which is another really unsettling thing. Right. Which is not long after where Haku's right. like, okay, great. You got right. a job. Right. Eat this human food. Right. And you'll remember your name and but not that, disappear. That other thing they set up, I mean, does it happen after the scene where they go back to her parents and she sees the pigs yes mm-hmm. first Haku takes her to the right. pigs I think it's there's because then there's the scene where she's eating the bun yeah and p- tears just starts pouring down Huge her face gelatinous tears <sighs> yeah. she's eating the rice balls Does that get you yeah that gets yeah. me a lot it also just that feeling of like food nourishing you right mm-hmm. now she has now she the sort of basic desires that you would forget about in yeah, the spirit right. totally. world David's like totally. grabbing his face yeah. like he's yeah. ripping his like skin off his skull that is a good moment it's great yeah but that thing, they and it's set nice up. Haku. Like we've right. seen mean Haku. Mm-hmm. Haku shows up with you, Bob, and he's like, "Fine, I'll take her. Whatever. Right. Fuck you." That thing they set up of like you need to be able to identify which ones were your parents, mm-hmm. and you need to remember right. this. These are your parents. Don't forget. Mm-hmm. I feel like as a kid, I, I used to have so many fears around like forgetting things mm. or not being able to understand things anymore. Mm. You know, especially like. I feel like when you're a child and you're being very emotionally affected by something and someone around you doesn't understand. Yeah. You know, why are you scared? Why are you sad? Why are you angry? Versus like the comfort you get in your parents being like, I understand this is that thing. You're afraid of bats or whatever. Right. right when right. someone's like, what's the deal? Some like sort of indifferent adult. I feel like I always had this fear of like, I don't, I don't want to become like that. Mm-hmm. Where I can't pick up on what other people are going through. You know, where I'm not attuned to things anymore, where I don't remember what things feels feel like. When I was a kid, I was very afraid of my voice changing because I knew that was a passage into adulthood. Your voice gets deeper. And I was like, what about my current voice? That can't be lost to time. Like I was very afraid of that. pipes too. Yeah, sure. And I think home videos and stuff like I was like, okay, there's like a record of my old voice. Now I don't think about these things. I was very afraid of it when I was like 10 years old. The Polar Express thing of like there are things you fundamentally will not be able to connect with anymore once you are grown. You know? Right, right, right. right, right, I I think like between like the name and like the remembering her parents, like all that stuff in the movie is just like there's a point where she can fall too deep into this where there's no going back. Where her childhood is fully over. Sure. She never goes back to that place of security with her boring parents. You know, it's just done. She will completely lose any sense of who she used to be. 
and any ability to to return to that life. Sure. Yeah, that's true. But it was it's terrifying. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that we haven't seen her her human childhood has not been idealized. No, it's not obvious to us why she should, other than the fact that like she's just a kid who has parents and it's good to have your parents. It's not obvious to us why she would be so concerned about saving her parents and leaving the bathhouse. I mean, she has kind of a rough job, but she's making friends. There is it's fulfilling. Right. I like I like the middle of this movie a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's not but But I know what you're saying. I mean she's gonna get sucked into adulthood. Like as as a perpetually sad and scared child who was not like greatly enjoying my childhood, I was also more than anything terrified of becoming an adult. I get really that. Yeah, yeah it like scared me so much I get that I get that I remember I would do that thing where I would go like okay wait so like right now I'm six and next year I'll be seven the year after that I'll be eight I would count up until I'd right. be like and then I'm gonna be 20 yeah and it's over and that would terrify me and I'd like run to my mom and I'd be like I'm only 13 years away from not being a kid anymore right I'm only like six years until I become a teenager or whatever you know but what were you afraid of I think I was afraid of losing the status quo, even if the status quo wasn't always comfortable for me. It was the security of that's what I knew. Yeah. So it wasn't anything inherent to your being a child. It was just that's what you happen to be and you don't like change. There was that, but there also was like certain concepts of being a child are like you have to make money. Like you have to be able to earn for yourself. You have to live on your own. Scrub the tub. Right. You have to do all these things. And I was like, I like that I don't have to do any of this. I don't have to worry about any of this. Right. But I feel like the appeal of what's happening to her in Spirited Away is that even though she has been drafted into service, she's part of a community now. Mm Mm-hmm. There's Yubaba, who's so frightening in that first scene. In the scene where they're scrubbing the tub, which is the sort of next big thing, right? Uh, when the um, you know, the stink spirit arrives, right. Scrub a tub. Uh, like Yubaba is not really very mean in that. She's kind of like there's the part where she like produces the fans and starts like that's amazing. You know, no, that's like, one of the best scenes in the movie. Uh, it's yeah. one of the right, and you feel like yeah, they're all in this together, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Yubaba's annoyed, like. Oh, stink spirit right, yeah but she's also good at her job she's like i know stink spirits i got nose right you know i, I nose yeah. nose and this isn't a regular like there's something's up with this this right. is like i mean like the first major set piece in the movie yeah which is how do you give a mud monster a bath <laughs> right? i love this guy the stink spirit yeah, yeah. i love the stink spirit there's, but a lot then to, I, there's a lot to relate to with that character and then i also yeah. love when he turns out to be a river. Yeah. Right. And is a uh, floating skeleton head attached to like a water serpent. Again, it's another it's another <laughs> uncanny moment of computer animation, yes, I think. Yes, that yeah. feels just a little bit off feels off and right, unsettling. Right. In a way that's very effective. But that right. feeling of just you're so dirty and tired and you've yeah, been traveling and it's right. like it's almost like Getting to the hotel finally and showering, right? But and all that, Pop, all that she like vomits metal human out of your garbage, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that she pulls like bicycles and things out of. Yeah, him. it's incredible. Woo. Yeah, pretty good movie, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and how hard it is, like getting the uh, thing to drop down, like right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pull, everything is hard, and like, also scrubbing. she is she is wading through. I mean, getting back to Shrek. She's wading through what could be fecal matter, like sure. a tub of diarrhea. I mean, yeah. I don't think it is diarrhea. It's not great. But let, you're, getting into some, you're getting into some pretty primal stuff with anal expulsion. and You know what I mean? Like, this very well might be Shrek's shit. Right. It's very possible. Yeah. We know Shrek shits. It's there in the beginning of the film. He right. flushed the outhouse. Yeah, but they weren't brave enough to show it, were they? They weren't. They're cowards yeah. over DreamWorks. And then DreamWorks apparently bid very competitively for this, for this movie, movie. That makes which sense. is a weird thing to think about if Katzenberg had this and Shrek. Right, right. But that makes sense because it was this Titanic Slayer. It was this sort of like this has got to be a phenomenon, right? And here. that's how DreamWorks was trying to feed Disney was going like, uh, what if we have a deal with Artemon? Like, what right, if we right. Have, we pull right. in all the rival animating. Right, right, oh, right. 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 Artemis, well, you're talking right. about Wallace and Gromit? Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Mm about those guys they're still around really i think so like didn't he do a relatively recent wallace he and did Gromit? but also wallace like a tv died. show the voice of wallace died. he did peter salas yeah. he was very old because he was old when he started voicing like he was a tv guy from britain like he i was knew that guy 102 in a grand day out um they did they did some tv shorts i think like five years ago was the last thing they did and the last proper short was like 2011 maybe mm-hmm yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. I mean, they were still doing stuff right up until he died, yeah. pretty much. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the stink spirit is the best um, <sighs> part of the movie set piece? No, because I mean, does the train count? Yeah. Because to me, the train is the like train is, is cinema. Right. Like it's like Ni- Nigel, the train and- is- Nigel Andrews is when he says like you you just want to pull a John Keats and just die. Yeah, I mean that's right. the, the the train is and the the one thing I knew going into this movie is people were like there's like a sort of an emotional climb like you know it kind of comes to a head on a train and I was like I love trains right yeah. this sounds great and then I watched the movie and I'm like she just sort of sits there and like right. life kind of rolls by right. I was like huh, it's a little underwhelming or is it the most whelming like- I know why is it so heavy why is that scene so fucking because heavy and emotional because it's being quiet it's right. just it, the movie is being quiet movies aren't quiet yeah movies just like sit down man everyone's got a life that they're living you know but it's <sighs> It's something about the train going over the shallow water. Yeah. It's also very dreamlike. And the like neon signs are going by and you see cities in the distance and, and there's sort the of like shadow, ghost the commuters. Frumpy sh- shadow commuters and then the little girl shadow on the platform and she's made her peace with no face and I don't – yeah. All right. So but back to – That's the, the best scene. But, yeah. I mean that's – In like a movie. Yeah. Yeah. I, I – Such an ex- existential moment. Yeah. yeah. And, right, and just right. – Right. Encapsulated. It's amazing. And, and again, you're watching a girl progress emotionally and learn things about herself, but not there's not moments where she says that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so here she's learning like sort of the like I mean, she gets a little vomit dumpling from the river spirit, which right. is pretty cool. Uh-huh. You know, a kid you would expect her to get like a sword or something. He gives her a vomit dumpling, but yeah, it right. is useful. Right. She gets a yeah, prize. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. But so she's learning the value of like teamwork and like collective spirit. Problem right? solving. Right, right. The sort of like, like there's that because after this, there's that thing where they're like, whew, they're going to bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Afterwards, they're like, oh god, that was a day. That's also a great scene. It's a great her scene. scene with yeah. Lynn. Or her, she's with Lynn, and yeah, they're yeah. like, they're eating because they got extra rounds of right. dinner yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. and more sake. Right. And like they're sitting on their little porch, their porch and they're in yeah. their aprons, and they're right. like, what a day! And I, like, yeah, you know, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's it's incredible. And that's when No Face. So No Face shows up in the middle of this. Mm-hmm. She lets her in by, him in by mistake because he seems nice. Yeah. He's got also, no just like us, she's like, how was I not supposed to know he was a spirit? He's just as freaky as everyone else. Yeah. Like, why shouldn't I let him in? Yeah. Right? right. It's like, like it's not like it, it should be like little uh, with a, an X through. Like, you know, this guy, yeah, he's right. no, his money's no good. No one's giving right. me a visual <laughs> glossary. Like, I'm, I'm riffing here. Yeah, I'm totally. improvising. Yeah. Kaunashi, faceless, mm. is his name. Mm-hmm. Um... I'm trying to figure out if he, like what he's based on. You know what I mean? Sure. Right. I it's, thought this was He doesn't exist in Japanese. Yeah, at all. I thought this was okay. just a Miyazaki right. like um thing he came up with. His face design is taken from a silkworm. Mm. Like the sort of the yeah, little yeah, pattern yeah. on right. his face. Yep. But he is just a sort of black cloak with a mask. Right. I guess. Uh he's spooky. He is spooky. He's the, he doesn't he's talk. the most iconic Image. Miyazaki right. character other than Totoro. I would say, you say so. Yeah, right? I would yeah. say absolutely. And what, again, this is like, where I don't know if the analysis is cultural, psychological, or something deeper, but like, why is this character so fucking iconic and intriguing? <laughs> what, yeah, All what he is is, is just this quiet thing. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's going to turn into a monster and eat people and barf right. gold. Like, that's interesting. <laughs> Pretty good. But I, but I mean, when he's just, sti- <laughs> and his little... Why is he so transfixing? Like, uh, wait, wait, yeah. uh, for most of the uh, film, I mean, he has the shape of uh, your water bottle sitting here. Right, like, he, right. For most of the film, he does not have any limbs. Right. He is just sort of like a, a big mound. Yeah, but if he walks, like a little foot might appear. You right. know what I mean? Like, he goes right. up sort of, steps. Right, right. Very slender, like surprisingly slender limbs, mm-hmm. I will say. Right. Yeah. He's Somewhat more, feminine. Yeah. yeah. Um. And uh, he's, I don't know, what does he represent? Like loneliness? That's the thing, though. So, well, uh, so I think if you're thinking about all this as a huge economic parable. Right, he is this, this thing that uh, doesn't make sense within the cogs of the, He's, a, the he's an angel investor. He's just right. someone who can just make money appear out of. But it's all bullshit. Then, right. right. He's right. Chris And Saka. also he's just modeling other, he's modeling the behavior of. Anyone what, he ingests. <laughs> anyone he's around, yeah. right? He and has, like, yeah. sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say like. He's no face. He has no identity. Right. He 
But then he eats the frog and he becomes greedy because the frog is greedy. Right. And so, you know, and like starts talking like the frog. Well, he's right. kind of a sociopath in a way that is scary where you sure. cannot figure out why someone is operating the way they're operating. Mm-hmm. Which, like, that's what happens when you remove someone's face and you can't read, you know, right. their emotions. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, like, well, very unnerving. Think about – by the time we meet No-Face, we've met a lot of unusual characters. Yeah. But they we've all some have, funny fellas. But they all have recognizably more or less human personalities. Mm-hmm. Yubaba is just cantankerous, grumpy, yes. right. bossy, boss, right. tyrannical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we know. We've all yeah, met sure, Lady yeah. Elaine Fairchild. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, what's his name? Boiler Room Man. Kamaji. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Crotchety. Rough, right. crotchety. Nice right. guy, but. Uh, heart right. of gold. Right. 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 Lynn. Lynn, right. boss, older sister. Right. You yeah. know. Haku. Uh, right. 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 Uh, m- mean boy that maybe you like. What is this feeling? Right. Yeah. But Radish no face. guy, like uh, Mr. Cool. Cool. Right. 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 Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Is he cool? Out. That's an interesting question. Yeah, no, like, I mean, he chill. definitely is like, doesn't, he seems hard to startle. You know what I mean? I think he's yeah. very, very relaxed. Right. Yeah. yeah. But no face is the most obviously enigmatic. Yeah. And I think you're right. What's What's a little disturbing about him is, you know, there's no real sense of motivation, I guess, other than just fathomless loneliness. Right. And emptiness. Right. I think a thing that is terrifying for a child. Like that's right. Like, your greatest fear is to end up that way. Um, and everyone in the bathhouse it exists in this sort of system, like this kind of like greedy system. Mm-hmm. You want to hoard what you can get. There's all the tags. There's the better tags and the worst yeah. tag. You know all mm-hmm. that stuff. So when he shows up and he's like, "I'll pay whatever for whatever you can provide," they're all they're like, "This is a bonanza." Right. But Sen is still a child. Does not have thoughts of like monetary gain. Like that's right. just not kind of in her character yet. Mm-hmm. So that's why she can like totally defeat No Face because yeah. he's like I can give you limitless gold and she's like I don't know. what am what I going to do with that gold, right she's yeah. kind of uncorruptible right I mean she's like I'm here to like rescue my parents and probably learn right. some valuable life lessons like you know about the spirit of work and the collective you know all that but if this is Miyazaki's story about contemporary Japanese culture and the emptiness of of post industrial capitalism. <laughs> Which it probably is, yeah. and that's and so we see everyone at their worst when No Face shows up with free unlimited money, yeah, because they're all yeah, debasing right. themselves in front right. of No Face, they're giving like No Face whatever they want, right, of food exactly, exactly. And he's, right, yeah, yeah, and and but do you think in Miyazaki's mind, No Face represents an actual economic condition in Japan or a personality or of the Japanese? I don't know. I don't know. I can't because no, remember what's interesting about No Face is No Face isn't really greedy, right? No, No Face no. just wants just attention. wants love, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, a hundred percent. I just can't imagine somebody who would throw around a lot of money in service of seeking validation from others. No, I'm, it makes zero sense. And and how far could that person possibly go? Right. You know. Exactly. And the idea of also that kind of person who is so hollow and vacant whose uh, motivations you can never figure out because there's nothing really going on there, uh-huh. uh, that people would just fall over themselves giving him anything he wanted. Right. You know, that they would totally debase themselves, that they would surrender all their values. That's why I'm saying this movie here, is hard here, to Here's a Miyazaki follow. quote. Right, just at, at the fear of him devouring them. Um, so here's something he no says. It's more about reality. the pigs, but, you know, it's, it's a, Chihiro's parents turning into pigs symbolizes how humans have become greedy. At the very moment, Chihiro says there's something odd about the town. Her parents turned into pigs. There are people that turned into pigs during Japan's bubble economy in the 1980s. And these people hadn't realized they'd become pigs. Right. Once someone becomes a pig, they don't return to being human. They just gradually start to have the body and soul of a pig. Real these talk. people are the ones yeah. saying, we're in a recession and we don't have enough to eat. This doesn't apply to a fantasy world. This isn't just, perhaps it isn't a coincidence that the food isn't actually a trap to catch lost humans. So, like, I think, yes, right. he probably well, I mean, is yeah. talking about I mean, what happened to his country. That right. metaphor is a little easier to read than No Face. It though, is. No, it right? is. I know. I know. But I'm just saying, like, you, you know. Do you know what I find very unnerving about the, the parent pig thing in particular? The transformation doesn't happen on screen, right? No. They don't give us, like, a Pinocchio thing we, where we, suddenly we they're ears. Right, right. right. But, but when you see them hunched over, yeah. they are sort of pig-like, yeah. like, right. when they're eating. But it's this fact that they, A, cannot stop eating. 
right? Yes, I mean, it's just 100, right. shoveling They can't one hear their thing. daughter. They're that's just, that's right. the thing. That, like, right. some switch goes off where they're like, this food is good. And then they become so thoroughly consumed by the food that they cannot hear her. Right. And they cannot stop moving things into their mouth. That it's just like, like that, they're gone. Um, 100%. Spirited away. Pigs. No face. Oh, yeah, right. So the medic dumpling, mm. the vomit dumpling. Right. Half of it is used to cure no face. Right. Mm-hmm. She puts it inside him. He just like he just emits. He voids. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Like just goo comes out of him, basically. Mm-hmm. Right. Down another, to- it's another really satisfying moment of expulsion. Right. And like this movie is filled with vomit. vomiting. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. This For is a, a children- pimple popping movie. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. This movie is simultaneously extremely spiritually esoteric S- and very <laughs> grounded with body horror mm-hmm. and like real mm-hmm. uh, fundamental like substances being secreted from orifices. I don't like human like beings are disgusting. It's what we call full spectrum dominance. Right. Uh-huh. And then, they, you know, um, with Haku, Haku is the, eats the other half right. of the dumpling. Uh-huh. And the, like, there's that moment where like, he's shaking and the blood suddenly yeah. just like, yes, yes. Yeah. Whaps against the wall. Yeah. Woo. Has there ever been an American children's film with this much body stuff? Fucking what's it called? Stand by me. Has the famous vomiting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. Like, Animated. Like, has yeah. Pixar ever made a movie where people no. throw up and go to the bathroom? Absolutely not. Uh, Pixar kind of skates far away from that kind of stuff. Monsters Inc. has bathroom shit. Really? It has scenes in a bathroom. It has a fair yeah. number of bathroom scenes. Yeah. Um, where they, they go a to ba- the bathroom and throw... No, it's more like there's a lot of antics in a bathroom. Those that, you know, uh, sh- they hide the little girl in the bathroom. Doesn't and, like, count. I'm talking about... Right, but there's no actual sort of bathroom talk. Right, like no kind of like pee pee poo poo blood pee. You know, I understand. Right, right, like I throw up, spit. Because the thing I remember most in Monsters Inc., which is burned into my brain forever, is uh, Steve Buscemi, whatever he's called. Yeah, where he goes, Randall, Randall, he goes like every time and bang, knocks open a bathroom door. Right, bang, does it again. Like that's the image in Monsters. Other monsters are using the toilet, though. I mean, it's just not. No, and it's like their job. Right, right. I'm trying to think. I mean, I feel like. When I would watch animated movies as a child that would give me this same sort of discomfort in, like, body horror, right. it would not be films that were intentionally trying to trap into something. They'd be movies that uh, were bad and right. accidentally were upsetting. Sure. Right, right. Like, there are things like the the weird Felix the Cat animated movie. Sure. Or, like, the weird, like, Raggedy Ann and Andy musical. I don't know that. Th- these are, like, bad animated films that were, like, failures and were disliked by children that I would watch a lot because my mother was so overprotective that they were the things playing on the few channels that she let me watch. Right. And those movies I remember having physical things that made me uncomfortable. The Japanese little Nemo and Slumberland movie. Um, but those movies are often not dealing with um, – very biological things. Like Ren and Stimpy and Rocco's Modern Life, those are TV shows, but those come to right. mind. They have like pus and boogers. Pus and oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah but always in a okay. gross out yeah. way, though. Right. It was in it was sort way of a more like, about But in that. this sort of like fetishistic, like, can you believe how like amazingly drawn this booger is? You know what I mean? Right. Like, right. You know, like where you, there, not, those like painted I mean, shots where they're zooming in on I mean, a nose. Right. You like, see their pores. Right. And the I guess what I mean, I mean, what's interesting about Spirited Away is that of those moments of. Like it's pretty gruesome, yeah. Um, but it's not done obviously f- as for humor or shock. It's thematic. Yeah, you no, know? no. After yeah. like this scene is when everything has to calm down and everyone needs to chill out. Right. Like it's very, it's very violent and sort of everything's been topsy turvy. And after he blow- barfs everywhere, he they need to they need to take it easy. Like yeah. right. like the movie has to be very calm now, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess there's what's the point with the baby? The point with the baby? When, when is she when, with the baby? That's before she goes on the train. Yes. Right? Like, this is all right? happening. Yes. Like, it's like, after this, she gets summoned to Yubaba's office. Yubaba's yelling at her. There's the pile of gold that turns into mush. Ugh. Right. But, like, there's the thing where Chihiro's with the baby in the baby's padded room. Right. Mm-hmm. And scares the baby with the with her hand, her dirty hand. Oh, I forgot about that. Right. Because yeah. right. the baby lives in this, like, totally the hermetic The baby's a world. bit of a germaphobe. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, the mother has convinced the baby that like the outside, the outside world, world is terrible. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, because the whole Yubaba. like and and right this yeah and Haku is being attacked by the fucking paper creatures. Yeah. That rules. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
uh, you see Haku in the distance, like, mm-hmm. and then and then it's like right on you, and it's really visceral and horrible. Yeah. But when Zaniba arrives, and she transforms everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you should explain that Zaniba has transferred herself via hologram into being one of these papers. Sure, she sort birds, of astrally projected herself and, through as, a paper and has airplane. attached herself. Uh, to the back of Chihiro, unbeknownst to her, so that she can get gain access to Yubaba's apartment and and, right. and look around, mm-hmm. where she suddenly creates mayhem. She right. turns the heads into the baby. She right. turns the baby into a mouse. Right. She turns the harpy, harpy creature into, into a, little, a little fly. But yeah. like a total cartoon. I mean, again, yes. this is when this is another moment where it's like, I don't. I've given up trying to understand what. Um, mythological world we're in but it's also like what kind of cartooning are we it's, doing it's here a totally like this looks like style. a disney yes. right or not even disney this just looks like a saturday morning cartoon the little mouse especially yeah right? Right, right out of cinderella yeah. Yeah. right yeah but but it's so crushing when you baba sees the mouse and is like get that out of here it's a mouse right, it's disgusting right. and she hears like you don't recognize that and then just tails off and the mouse looks so sad and then they just leave you know what? When you're asking, like, are there other animated films that deal with that sort of body horror? Right. I think the thing that I, I feel like would affect me as a child, I can't think of other things that are that visceral and biological in that sense. But it was always the um, – when, when people's bodies change. Oh. You know? So anything where someone gets stuck inside another person's body but also anything where, like, their body gets morphed in any sort of way, mm-hmm. gets mutated, mm-hmm. gets affected. hmm where there's some sort of like corruption from the outside. With Pinocchio, when they all turn into freaks me the fuck out. Well, yeah, because yeah. well, the, yeah, and the you're transformation kid, you know. of pigs feels yeah. sort right. of like you, you know. know what's coming. If you're a kid, you know what's coming. Your body is going to right. go through changes. <laughs> but right? this movie's got like a ton of that. Yeah, all yeah. The, yeah. Like, most of these characters have at least one transformation. Well, yeah. this yeah, she's Whether in a liminal space not. between mm-hmm. childhood right. and adulthood, right. right? Like, so she's gonna have some crazy. Change is coming on. I think that's the thing. I mean, once again, speaking just as a, uh, someone who is an incredibly terrified child, I think it was just like, this is already so overwhelming. I don't want anything to change. Right. Mm. right. Yeah. I, just, you, I just got a footing on this. I'm right. going to lose my voice. Right. You know, I'm going to have to shave. Like, what the fuck are you Hair throwing at Hair coming out me? every which way. All of that. Get it yeah. out of here. Pimples. You know? Yeah. Let me just stay here. Yeah. And also the adult world is mean and, yeah. and hard to, like, figure out and you're – you, you got to, like, just be strong. My parents you seem tired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I've told this story, I'm sure, before on the podcast. But it's a thing that probably, like, uh, uh, kind of broke me as a human being. In many ways, you could look to my current <laughs> lifestyle <laughs> and extrapolate how this affected me. Mm-hmm. Uh, when my si- mom was pregnant with my sister, so I was uh, eight going on nine. And my brother and I had shared a room, and now we were – going to get separate bedrooms for the first time Oh, because we had a third kid. It was, right, yeah, we yeah. had to get a bigger space. Um, so my mom asked me what color I wanted my walls to be, and I said I wanted the cloud wallpaper from Toy Story. And my mom said she would not let me do that because I wouldn't like Toy Story for much longer. Whoa. That is crazy that she said that to you. Right? Like, when I, she's like, I know I you like know. it right like, now, yeah. but and you I got, like, two more years is, is it an investment? Like, how much was – it was probably a lot of money to buy that wallpaper. Sure. But she, she did break it down in those terms. I said, right. what do you mean? And she went, look, I know you love Toy Story now, but you're eight, and soon you're going to be nine, and maybe you'll still like it when you're 10 or 11. But when you're 13, you're not going to want to live you're in You're going to be embarrassed. Room. She's worried that you're going to be embarrassed Correct. as a I teenager. Know. I kind of side with your mom on that. I broke down crying. And I live in an apartment that's 90% Toy Story. Right, right, right. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like Is my, Toy Story good? It's, it's my okay. favorite. It's He's wearing best, a forky it's a hat. It's a master. I'm wearing a forky hat. Oh, from the new Toy Story. Yeah. Toy Story's a masterpiece. You should watch it. I think you'd like it. I don't know, man. I don't want to... I don't want to go dumping on Pixar. I know you don't it's like It's kind of my wife's job, but... I know. <laughs> yeah, Emily is... But I, I feel like... Speed bag with, with, the, with the, these yeah. Pixar movies... That's kind of what I'm talking about, the Entertainment Weekly thing of like, God, Toy Story is just such a sat- is such a satisfying instantiation of the art of storytelling. This is a flawless m- machine delivering emotions. Okay, but here's my whole take. I'm not going to get into this because I do Please, this every not. episode. All right. yep. But that the Toy Story uh, movies are about existential meaningless. 
they they sometimes are. I think the Toy Story movies are pretty good. I think they all right. are. Um, I think they're, they're about right. these characters having to reckon with the fact that they have no reason to be alive. There's stuff to talk about with Toy Story. I don't like them as much as him, though. All right. But the point is, in some ways, I think my mother saying that to me probably caused me to out of defiance. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Never right. let oh. go. Oh. Never let go of Toy Story. Right. And I can empirically, like as an adult, rationalize why I still value them as movies and all of this. But I also think that concept terrified me so much. Her telling me fundamentally there are things that mean the most to you in the world right now yeah. that you will not only yeah, not care heavy. about yeah, later. Right, right. You won't like them. You will be embarrassed by the yeah, fact yeah, that yeah. you right. ever That was a heavy them. lesson. It freaked the fuck out of me. Yep. Oh. Yeah. And I think I that, that that kind of thing of like you will change. The things you care about will change. Your name will change. You know, all these sorts of things. I had the same thing with starting fires. They told you you would grow out of starting fires? And I never did. Okay. David. Yes. <laughs> Horrible noise. Happy New Year. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Na, 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 I mean, it is na, Rosh Hashanah. Na, na, na. <laughs> exactly. Rosh Hashanah Tavah to Noom. Two important calendar points here, okay? Mm-hmm. Jewish New Year mm. and Happy Noom Year. Explain. I don't know. I've just decided this is the start of a Noom Year. Okay, so maybe you're going to use Noom to, like, you know, start improving your life? This is true. I've I've been uh, I've been trying to get in shape a little bit yeah, recently, and, and I know I've been saying that for months, but the fact is I haven't been doing it. But now I'm doing it. And getting in shape, it's not just losing weight. You know, no, you got to learn better, habits. It's habits. This is the thing I've been trying Healthy to do. habits. That's what I've been changing. And it's now... I'm just doing it for the first time, which means I'm considering it the start of a Noom year because the rest of this year didn't count. So Noom is this one program for all your health and weight loss needs. Mm-hmm. You don't have to hunt around for training apps and workouts and calorie trackers and meal plans. you got to be it's craving to all. hunt down all those things. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. It's got it all, Craven and you can even it. add – Yes, <laughs> I know. You can add a goal specialist. From the Spider-Man a, comic. And a community of members who can keep you motivated and accountable. It's like a workout bestie. All in one. Accountability, buddy. Yeah, you sure. Get some accountability buddies. Uh, so you can set goals for like physical stuff, like yeah. um, you know, wanting to feel confident in clothing or better self care stuff like that. You can do it for psychological stuff, like your mood. You can controlling controlling your stress and anxiety, or you can do social stuff, like to try and get you to go out a little bit more mm-hmm. or be more comfortable in social environments. Yeah, Noom can help you break any bad habits you thought you couldn't break before. Okay. Yeah. You talk to your goal specialist. You can confide in them when you're screwing up, you know, and they can try and encourage you. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a very easy app to use. You've got it on your phone. I've got it on my phone. We love Noom. Uh, What else can we say? Uh, I don't know. It's a Noom year. It's a Noom start. It's not a diet. It's a healthy and easy to stick to way of life. It doesn't make food off limits. It teaches moderation. It can you can use it in conjunction with any pre-existing popular diet if you want to do that. And we're all strapped for time, okay? Noom is just asking you to commit 10 lousy minutes a day for yourself. 10 minutes. Okay. So you don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. So you can sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash check. Okay? Okay. What do you have to lose? Visit Noom dot com slash check. Wait to lose? Sure. To start your trial today. That's Noom dot com slash check. It's the last weight loss program you're ever going to need. Happy Noom year. So he gathers all of the sort of – she gathers, sorry, all of the sort of broken creatures, right? Mm-hmm. Island of Misfit Toys. Yeah. Mouse Baby, mm-hmm. Fly Harpy, mm-hmm. No Face, who's <laughs> kind of like – I look, I tried being, you know, Mr. Mr. Business. Nobody yeah. likes that. Yeah, your classic pussy posse. <laughs> we're talking right. about here. And uh, wait, there's five people on the train, right? Isn't it? Uh, Isn't there five creatures on the train or just four? There's four. There's yeah. just four? Lucas Haas. Yeah. Uh, she goes down to – Kamaji, she she feeds, you know, like she retrieves Haku's curse and squishes it. Mm-hmm. I love that moment where he's like, make a, make a circle. I have right. to break yeah, the yeah. curse. Right, yeah. You know, where she's like. Yeah. Um, and Kamaji's like, go take the train, go see Zaniba and go figure it out. This is a moment in the movie. This is one of Chihiro's great initiatives where it's her idea. Of like, I'm going to make this right. I'm going to apologize on behalf of Haku. He didn't know what he was doing. Uh, I'm going to go make this right. Uh, right. Right. Um, it is Chihiro accepting responsibility as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, accepting responsibility, but not 
accepting responsibility almost doubly so because she's actually doing the ultimate responsible thing, which is accepting responsibility on behalf of someone who's not in condition to accept responsibility. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels a right. little even more right. interesting and um, loving. Yeah. Right. right. Which I think that's why Zaniba is so moved by it. Mm-hmm. Right. You want one thing. Your love broke the curse. But this what she and, says? Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, like she's so amused to hear. She's like, that wasn't me. That's Yubaba. Right. Yubaba's yeah. the one with the contracts and the curses and the <laughs> yeah. I own your life forever, you know. Um, but it is so Miyazaki as well. That's sort of like you're going to exit urban and environment you're going to go to the countryside where like things are lived simply and you make what you use and you right you know like you find your own new sense of right security i love i mean obviously we talked about the train ride i don't know whatever you want to say about the train we we, we talked about it i mean what i mean it's just it's (laughs) iconic it's just one of those things that just feels like uh name a uh, more iconic train ride i dare you yeah you can yeah yeah. I don't know. There's just something and but, but again it's like you can't help but wonder like why is this doing this to my mind? Like what yeah. is this? Right. It is it's, right. it's sunset. I guess it's dusk. Yeah. So it's I mean again we don't we keep talking it's about a shot it, of her walking on the water. We like, keep talking yeah. yeah, talking about liminal spaces and now we yeah. have even more piled up because now we're in space we're in twilight, right? Isn't right. that the lighting is like yeah. a twilight? Well, the sun vibe. is setting and it yeah. turns tonight. Right. Yeah. You're on the you're you're on a train track that's in shallow water. Right. Yeah. Which is cool. Also, is just kind of weird and, and. And we've been seeing the train the whole movie. Occasionally, right, yeah, it'll it'll sort of go by. Through, right. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Okay. It's an old train. But with shadow that moment also where Lynn kind of takes her in the little bathtub. Yeah. To the station. Right. And then she's like watching she hear her go, and you see her realize like this is a good person that yeah. I know. Yeah. And yeah. she's like, I'm sorry, I called you a klutz. You're not right, a klutz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, Which also like, kind of gets me. Yeah. It gets this idea of this movie being kind of undeniable unless you have like deliberately constructed a wall between you and it like I did as a 13-year-old. Right. Is that it's almost like this movie has like identified certain tones that like evoke a, a physiological response from humans, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Like it's like cracked into something that you can't fucking understand why – all these story elements, these single images, these plot points are like right. He's affecting like you in this rhythms. way, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, because you never feel it. Never feels cloying or no. exploitive or manipulative, the way that type of move can feel. And so, often you know what I mean? It is like, so unexplained too, where you're like, right. I can't even make sense of what's going on on screen, let alone why it's affecting me. I I was like trying to see like you know writings he did about the film. Uh, to see what he thinks the movie's about or how he talks about it. Sure. And obviously, you know, I think he likes to be a little bit elusive and not over explain stuff. Mm-hmm. And also that it shifts sometimes. But there was this thing of like uh, – uh, this is on the Wikipedia page. Every summer, Hayao Miyazaki spent his vacation in a mountain cabin with his family and five girls who were friends of the family. Right. The idea from Spirit Away came about when he wanted to make a film for these friends. Miyazaki had previously directed films for small children and teenagers such as My Neighbor Totoro – and Kiki's Delivery Service, but he had not created a film for 10-year-old girls, which is such a weird... But right, that but that moment of adolescence is what he's right. right. But also the great thing about that story is he kind of thought these girls were idiots, right? right. These right. are the he's girls like, who were just They really like, need to learn about scrubbing. Right, exactly. Well, he said, for inspiration, he read Sojo manga magazines like Nayokashi and Reban, the girls left at the cabin, but felt that they only offered subjects on crushes and romance. Right. right. When looking at his young friends, Miyazaki felt this was not what they, quote, held dear in their hearts and decide to produce the film about a girl heroine whom they could look up to instead. And then, like, the movie then generates out of the fact, like, he wanted to produce a film for new, two years. He had two previous proposals. One of them was based on a book. He had a third proposal uh, that was about a bathhouse. He was interested in the bathhouse because he was always curious about what happened behind the door yeah, yeah. that was making the bathhouse right. run. Right. And then this... Crazy line here. And sometimes I wonder when they like attribute quotes to Miyazaki if they're like simplifying what he said because they make sure. it sound like he's a man who only ever says like the five coldest, words most a week. frightening thing. Right. right. Miyazaki did not want to make the hero, quote, a pretty girl. Right. At the beginning, he was frustrated how she looked, quote, dull and thought, quote, she isn't cute. Isn't there something we can do? As the film neared the end, however, he was relieved to feel, quote, she will be a charming woman. Okay. Squad goals. What a weird thing to say. Sure. Uh, yes, I am relieved. She will be a charming woman. But that is, I mean, when you watch the documentaries about him, it is sort of him staring at an image and being like, no, I'm not like 
life is not being evoked here. Right. Like, you know, yeah. like it's just not, it needs to move differently. There's right. something wrong. The eyes need to be different. Right. Like yeah. he's sort of like, that's his obsessive, like kind of blank checky. Right. Approach. But that he was sort of like, I need to figure out how to make a movie about the inner lives of these girls. And these magazines can't explain it to me, and these girls can't explain it to me. Right, and it can't be about having crushes and right, like, right, 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 being a, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Right, but then also like his insistence on like she can't be like too adorable. Right. You know, but I also don't want her to be unappealing. Right. That he's like going for this like weird like sort of dog whistle tone in the middle. Right. But I've. She's pretty adorable, right? She's, I mean, she's, she's one of uh, a she's character a, I feel really like. I her to be a charming woman. Yeah, yeah. Um, but especially, as I said, like just the train that it's like you're seeing her be quiet, sit in her thoughts. These are not things that teenagers do really. So right. You're younger than teenagers, right? Like yeah. um, contemplate the world around her, but also just hmm. sort of be quiet. It's just weird to see a lead character. And be also, quiet. she's comfortable in a space. Right, she's literally surrounded she by these down, incredible characters, and no with faces, no faces like, like okay, I'll sit down filled out, like, right. and then the two, the the and um, they, mouse and the, the um, mouse and the bird, yeah, right. They get to the train station. Almost everyone's gone. There's the lantern with the foot right. that pops to Pop you, lantern. right? Um, but then, like, when they get to Zaniba's, she's like, "Please, can you change them back?" And she's like, "They can change back whenever they want." <laughs> that curse is over, right? And it's like, right, they're sitting in it too. They're like, "Yeah, I don't think I'm ready to be a baby yet." Uh, you know, I yeah. think I need to like run on a little spinning wheel mm-hmm. for a while mm-hmm. and make like a magical uh, hair tie to strengthen the bonds between right. us. Right, that's what she gets from Zaniba. Why is Zaniba also living in a Western style kind of fairy tale cottage? I don't know. Why are you, Baba and Zaniba, both kind of Westernized, right? British or European? Yeah, that's a good point. I don't I know. know. You, Baba, um, she has. Let's see. I don't know. No. She is stylistically different from everything else. Right. Which I guess is maybe just... I love that her phone is a skull as well. Don't forget about that. I forgot about that. She grips a skull and then the skull's like... Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty great. Yeah. That's one of those things where you're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they remember that there's just a shot in Spirited Away of, like, seven giant chicks, you know, in a bath. It's just a shot for, like, one second. You know, you just see the big chicks... Oh, yeah. Like, taking a bath. Yeah. The and heads like, were the thing I couldn't the get heads. over. Where I was like, there's a movie where this happens? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I just like, I like, I mean, whatever. I love this movie. You know, I like that it just calms down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then and then Haku is there to fly her home. That's they, an... In- the that, shot of him, like, oh, in all majestic yeah, yeah. Japanese waiting, sea dragon glory. Waiting outside the, the uh, cabin. It's a real glow up. Yeah. And she remembers. She and she, as together. they're flying, she's like, right. You're right. He was the podcast. Right. Yeah. And uh, the scales fall from, we already talked about that. Right. I yeah. mean, it's so emotional. Yeah. After that, it feels like she's indestructible. That's why, like, the, the, right. the climax is, that's the climax. Like, her, the pig thing is, like, just a little coda. Like, you know, you already know, like, there's, that's wrapping there's up. no problem. And She'll she doesn't be fine. hesitate. She has the right. answer She's fully confident. Yubaba's sort of, like, whole intimidation thing is kind of over. Right. right. Uh, well, I think part of that is because in that moment, she's in remembering something about herself. She's answering a question about herself. She's one step right. closer to understanding who she is, right? And yeah. she's yeah, she is like firmly two feet, like one in each world, right? Like right. She has that kind of that's sort of her magic power. Yeah, yeah, right. She's a ghost rider. She's the only one who can walk both worlds. Right. Yeah. She's blade. She's a day walker. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. She realizes the entire test is bullshit. She rejects your premise. Right. They None all of turn into guys parents. who are like, you did it! Right. So here's my question. And then she walks away and everyone cheers. But here's my question. The very end there? The end of the movie. Yeah, I want to dig into I this. I want to dig into this too. I know exactly what you're going to say. You know what I'm about? The, mo- the moment ahead. in the tunnel. Go ahead. She's wa- they're walking back out. You can't look behind you, sort of right. Orpheus style. Right, right. Yeah. right. Got her, salvaged her parents. Because suddenly she's parents just back humans. in the field, back in the right. In the and her and right. time has parents. passed. Right, it's not like one of those childish right. fantasies right. where That's it's the like big thing. I want it was a lickety split. Like, oh no, I don't want to talk about that. Okay. I want to talk well, about. But I love stuff. that that the car is like overgrown. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, like, it's been a minute. It's <laughs> been like months. Right. They yeah. go from saying like, I wonder if the movers like are, if we right. can still beat the movers right. Right. to them being like, wait, what is the vegetation doing around our car? Okay, but here's my thing. They're walking back out through the tunnel. 
and we see the exact same we we see the exact same moment they had when they entered the tunnel, mm-hmm. which is Chihiro grabbing onto her mom, right? And her mom saying, uh, "Stop squeezing me so hard, or I'm gonna trip." Something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, in most movies where a child has crossed through a tunnel mm-hmm. and gained understanding and confidence and identity by working in a bathhouse for spirits, mm-hmm. has saved her parents, and then is walking back out through the same tunnel to begin her new life. Her behavior has changed. She would not still be holding on to her mom yeah. for dear life. She would be walking independently, comfortable, yeah. loving her parents, but but feeling safe and secure without having to hold the on to them. The way I interpret this is that it's in, her relationship with her parents is entirely – she's glad to have them back. Right. Like that she's like – yeah, right? Like, that's why she's grabbing on. It's not out of fear. It's out of, like, you're here. I, right. I like, think, you're real. I think there's a, another thing, too, which is that uh, her journey has given her an understanding of the adult world. It has not fundamentally changed how she is going to behave. Right. It is just her understanding of what is inevitable and what she will become. This movie, her experience in the bathhouse... Is like your experience when your parents have a cocktail party and you're supposed to be in bed, yes. and then you come out and listen at the door, right? And you and you listen to what adults are really like, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And you're like, I now understand it, and I'm right. going to go back. It doesn't to bed. mean I'm an adult. I'm going to continue being a child, right? Right. And right. I think right. she comes out of this fully deciding. I still get deciding. to be a kid, right? I, right. I right. certainly see the value in being a kid, right? Like I'm in no rush to get there, but at least I understand it now, and it scares me right. less. And like with Haku, she's like, "Will I ever see you again?" He's like, "Definitely," right? And you're like. Don't know what that means or how that means, but sure. Okay. Yeah. You right. know, you have these. Does she keep her memories? Like, is it gone? Is it right. sort of part of her, but she can't remember all that? I don't know. You know, they don't explain that yeah. and they don't explain the passage of time. And I love their parents are like, what is this? Some kind of prank? The kids put uh, leaves, leaves and dirt and dust on your car. We're going to go. We're going to go leaf that guy's car. Yeah. And then they just drive right. away. Like the movie's over with all these questions of like, how long were they in there? And then there's one of those great songs where it's like, oh, I'm yeah. Right. But I love, I mean, I love that it doesn't answer this, but I also love thinking about, like, do they arrive at their home and it's like, you know. The movers are like, we've been trying you every day for the past two weeks. We reported you dead. Right. You didn't show up eight months ago. <laughs> right. This building is condemned. <sighs> but honestly, even within the even within the chronology of life at the bathhouse, it couldn't have been more than a few days, was it? No, I think it's been months. Oh, I think you're right. I think Actually, it's been yeah. you know, You're yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, we're not seeing everything. Right. Like, you know, like she's been working there for a okay. while. Yeah. yeah. I think it's been a while. Working nine to five. So, David. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What's what? Up? What is it about this movie? Solve it for us, David. Oh, I don't. I mean, we've been doing our Solve best. Solve it, David. But, but I, for you, I, I just mean for you. This is one of your favorite mm, movies, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Top 10? Yeah. 100%. There's just no question. Yeah. So, what is it? Well, I mean, we were talking about that about liminal spaces, right. penumbras, right. foot in each world. Mm-hmm. Right. So maybe it's that that it, it partly sort of evokes that for me, like that sensation of being a child, that sensation of growing up, of like things being unknown and discovering the unknown. Uh huh. I don't know. I don't know. Put me on the spot. This, we've just been talking two hours about what I, I love know, about but now movie. it's like we've been talking tunes. Now I really want to like get real. Like, what is it? I'm. I. I, I don't know. There's. I don't know. I don't. I don't mean to like miss make this movie like a mystical artifact, like, but it does just feel like it's one of those movies where it's just like, it's like lightning it's in a bottle. It's like yes. lightning in a bottle. This is it's it. Just, right. And right? I love all the other. I basically love any movie he's ever made. Right. Um. But it, this is. But my they're favorite. not like has, I've seen a yes. lot of them, and a lot of them are great. But it's like, like this is like on a different level. Yeah. There don't is you a think? weird power retained in this movie, and unlike the other movies that I think. I have seen that have that sort of like uh, magic uh, lightning in a bottle quality. Mm -hmm. Those movies are less uh, elusive in their meaning, you know? Right. Like films you watch like like the original Wizard of Oz where you're like something just works here. There's something they bottled Uh for how much you've heard about how disastrous the production was, you know? Right. It works better than any other adaptation. There's some quality that movie has that the books don't have, not to say it's better or worse, right. but there's some power there. Yeah. But that as a similar type of story is a far more literal version of a fantastical movie. And so yeah, this movie it has doesn't, right. that yeah, yeah. weird artist lightning in a bottle thing, which is then intensified by the fact that it's animated. 
so that there are no mistakes. Nothing is by chance. Right, Nothing right, is right, right. this happened by, on camera. You know, uh-huh, this right, didn't work. Right. Everything is the conscious decision making process of people's hands and their brains and their thoughts and feelings and all of that. And then you add on to that that he that lightning in a bottle is happening on a movie that is by its very design kind of obtuse. Right. It is obtuse. And dealing on it's sort incredibly of a subconscious, rewarding, unconscious level. Infinitely rewarding. But also when I feel it, I have a very profound emotional reaction to it. And I right. don't – like one that I can't explain, one that, one that feels like that's coming from like the bottom of me. That's what I mean. Like that's, right. Right. that's my but real like, question. I'm not joking when like, I say like I literally was like hacking sobs. Right. R- like, like a switch had been – Watching right. it again last right. night. Right. Watching it again. I watched wow. – it wasn't last night. It was like a couple yeah. days ago. Uh, and I just like had – Anytime I put this on, I feel like incredibly happy and serene and like involved and yeah. all that. And then like I'm like, oh, and this is the moment where I cry. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I'm probably not going to cry this time. But like, there's you know. something almost like the movie is existing like like an ASMR video. Like it's like triggering something. Well, that's what you're saying with the brainwave thing, like where it's like it somehow is like found some biometric frequency for you that you didn't like. You know, like you know what I mean. Right. It's permeated your consciousness. There's something about like the combination (sighs) of like the story and the images and the sounds and the music and all of that that just like hits you and in some weird place in your spine. I guess. I guess my question is because it does feel so extraordinary and just so different from all of his other movies. I I wonder if Miyazaki himself was kind of surprised, like, whoa, like this 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 is incredible. No, like, I, this wow. is, like, I kind of nailed this. No, one, right? you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. where even even the creator would be, because you know, if you create something, sometimes you can be like, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I guess I just had a hot streak, you know, or or yeah. I wonder if it's the same. But but the thing about this movie is animation takes so much planning right it's so much everything has to be accounted for yeah. like just like as there's no mistakes because you're not shooting on right. film there's also no mistakes right accidents right? don't happen in right. the same kind of yeah way. exactly accidents right. don't happen that's the pr- and, and right. this production was so like over budget totally panicking changing right. everything at the last minute right. like the whole story of the production is really wild yeah. and the fact that it wasn't like post princess Mononoke, he's like cool i have my blank check now i can do whatever i want no. time for me to make my masterpiece no he, was, he was like, like i retire like, Right. Okay, yeah. Is it? yeah, yeah. After when Ronan okay was like, "Well, I think that's the best I can do." That and was his mic drop. For me to be, right. I'm over. And then when he came back to it, he was like, "I don't know. Should I adapt the book? I'm right. interested yeah, right. in bathhouse doors. What about these girls I vacation with?" Like he was like pulling from like right. Eight it's not like things. he's like this has been inside me forever, right. and it's Finally. time for it to come Finally. out. Finally, spirit. Right. Right. Okay, was kind of that. He yeah. was like, yeah, "I've been yeah, working yeah, yeah. on this for right. 25 years. Right. Yeah. I've never been able to tell this mythic story of right. Japan, right? And like our relationship that with the world. That movie is the culmination of all of his artistic right. interests. And I made an epic, my longest movie, right. my most sensational movie. You know, right. and then Spirited Away is like right him being like, "But what's behind that bathhouse door?" Right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing you're talking about, it's a guy with a mustache. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Six arms. The thing you're talking about, where sometimes people are like, "I have no idea where that song came from." Hmm, I am like as one perplexed of those things, by that right? song existing as you are, and I'm the person who wrote and performed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember yeah. the process of doing it. I don't know why it came to me. I don't know how it came out in the way it did. But I'm kind of. It's just sort of, as I said, this sort of undeniable object. Yeah. Uh, now let's talk about the money it made. Oh, sure. I mean, we were going to have a real box office game because it did come out yeah. in America. But uh, in Japan, obviously, it was, as we talked about in a previous episode, whichever one we did, the, like, top movies of Japan ever. Was that? Pocoroso? Yeah. Um, you know, it was an indestructible force. It made $229 million. Uh-huh. Which uh, ooh, it translates to, like, 50 laptop. billion yen, I think. Yeah. You know. A number that sounds insane. Um. So obviously it made most of its money overseas. It was also highly successful in China. Yeah. Uh where it only came out this year. It had made had, 200 million dollars before it was released in the US or China. Right, which was like unheard of. Right. It was a like kind of the first movie to be so huge internationally right. that it was one of the top grossing films of its year having not been released right. in the United States. It also did really well in places like Korea and Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. It did really well in France. It did yeah. really well in, you know, it did well everywhere else. Uh, it made about $10 million in America, which was was significant. Yes. It was significant because the Mononoke had really not. Yeah. It had been treated like this sort of like art house film by right. Miramax. Right. Uh, this was distributed by Disney. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and it did make some money. It had a DVD release and that I bought, you know, that was like pretty well done. The dub, Especially I think post Oscars, that was huge. The dub is solid. It's not my favorite. I uh-huh. don't think Devay Chase is particularly I good as Chihiro. She's kind of shrill. I've, I don't think I've ever watched it. With Everyone the else English is okay. Voices. Suzanne Plachette kind of rules. Suzanne really? Plachette plays Zubaba Zuniba, Zuniba. but she's great. Yeah. Uh, some of them are good, you know. Uh, uh, Jason Marsden, who plays uh, Haku, is like one of those he's guys one of those who was the guys. voice on everything. And yeah. I remember finding it very distracting. Oh, right. Because you're watching yeah, it the yeah. whole time going like, right. which cartoon show is he right, from? Right, right, right. He's like very recognizable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's that. I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's an okay. I mean, I, I saw it. The first time I saw it was actually in Japanese with subtitles in the cinema. Yeah. Uh, good for the Camden Town audience. Um, but I've seen the dub because it was on TV all the time too. Right. It's like, anyway. Here is a, a not that surprising uh, stat. Mm. Uh, obviously the only, uh, not obviously, but unsurprisingly, the only foreign language film to win the Best Animated Film Oscar. <sighs> also now, to date, the only hand-drawn film to win. Really? Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, that's depressing. It is the right, only one. Because Wallace and Gromit won that was stop motion. Uh, everything else has been CG. CGI or, or like yeah. Rango is kind of like mocap y yeah. CG, right? Right. Uh, yeah. It's into the Spider Verse kind of has elements of all it kinds of animation, it is CG. but it it's is. all made in uh, computers. I mean, the most generous thing you could say about it is a CG film in which they like did hand drawn 2D animation on top of the CG. Right. And then the, this movie wins Best Animated Feature. It was up against. Movies that represent sort of all sorts of moments in yeah. animation. So you've got Treasure Planet, which is like the dying of Dis- like the Disney traditional Treasure feature. Planet. Yeah, it's like a sci-fi Treasure Island. Oh, we need animation. to have you on for our Treasure Planet episode. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, which right. is this very painterly, pretty horse movie. This is a year 2D. with five nominees, oh, five but nominees. very often it's only three nominees in Best Animated. Well, now it's always five. But, but in the past, it had been sure. usually three. There, right. In the past, there was some sort of – there had to be enough animated features released in a year. Yes, to make there's a five. qualifying number. Now it's five. This was the first five year though, right? And it was I the feel like only the... five year until 2009. Oh, crazy. Right. Okay. Uh, so you had Ice Age, which is like yeah. the early DreamWorks kind of like – I don't know. It was not DreamWorks. It was Blue Sky. Yeah, Blue Sky, sorry. It's a totally it's functional, adequate. pleasant it's movie. It's cute. And I remember people being afraid it was going to win because it was a massive hit. It was a huge hit. And this was a non-Pixar year, so it was like there isn't an obvious thing to dominate. But there was Lilo and Stitch, which is a lovely Disney movie. It's an incredible One film. of the better Disney One movies of, the best of that Disney era. Films ever made. Uh, Have you seen is, that movie? No. That movie is the closest Disney has ever come to doing me as a It's a pretty cute movie. Really? It's pretty great. Yeah. It's a little Hawaiian girl meets an alien. They have, uh, you know. Adventures. But it is a film about like childhood loneliness. It's about right. a child being raised by her older sister after the parents die. But I remember it was the and, first award of the night. Yeah. Cameron Diaz presented it as the uh, sort of standing in for Shrek, I think. Yes. I think she has presented Best Animated Film three times. Yeah, she if does I'm it not a lot. Mistaken. Is she in Shrek? She is Princess, Princess Fiona. Fiona, how Fiona! Can you oh, Fiona! Oh, Fiona! I've rescued you from the tower. Fiona! Like they do in Disney movies. Smell my farts. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but I remember she Get presented belly, it. Fiona. I was and I was like and, and me spirited away one. Yeah. There was sort of claps. Miyazaki obviously was not there and she right. was like, Okay, and you're sort of like something significant just happened. And yeah. it's just sort of like we're just gonna move on. Right. Now. Yeah. Anyway. Especially after Shrek wins the first year. Right. It's like it's like, oh, we've honored like the totemic figure of animation with that was the big an thing. award for it's his like great film. The stats that people always throw out, like, well, you know, Hitchcock never won an Oscar, right. Kubrick yeah, yeah. never won an Oscar, you know, so like all the great legends of cinema. It shows you how meaningless this award is. Right. And then you look at Best Animated Film, and they kind of have given it to right. most all of the, the most great important animators living. Have won. Right. right, even you know, debating you know the, the most important alive canonical feature animators have all sort of won the Oscar now. And then you throw in a couple people like um, uh, fucking uh, George, uh, George Miller. Miller, you know, and like Gore Verbinski, and people who are kind of overlooked in live action. You know, like most of Tim Burton and uh, Wes Anderson's – Tim Burton's only Oscar nominations come from animated even though those two films aren't very good. Most of Wes Anderson's nominations come from his animated films. It's, it's an odd phenomenon. Hmm. That category has kind of mostly gotten it fairly right. Here are the five films though. September 20th, 20, 2002 for the okay. box office game. To a good box office game. Spirit Away opens in 18th position on 26th screen. Okay. So it's not in the top five. Number one. As a comedy that was kind of a phenomenon. In September of 2000. Do you remember this movie? No. No. I what? never saw it. But it felt like a movie where you were kind of like, hmm, we kind of have to go see that. But I guess I remember. It was kind of a crossover moment around. for this kind oh, of movie. September moment. 2002. I'm sorry. I was thinking uh, Shadow of 9 11. This is September of 2002. That's right. 
And it felt like a watershed thing. Right. And it, uh, is it, a, is it a big star? No. It's not. No, it's an ensemble comedy. It has big actors in it. It has big actors in it. But it is a in it. ensemble comedy about life in a community. It's like a big, broad, kind of, you know, talky, goofy comedy. There were a bunch of sequels and spinoffs. Okay, this is the first one? Yeah. Is this its first weekend? Second weekend. What's it doing this weekend? 12. So what did it open to? Uh, 20. This is all important for me. 20. Okay. And what's Versus it? 75. The final gross is 75? Yeah. But it gets a bunch of sequels. Oh, is it Barbershop? Barbershop. A movie Same that stories, I think Barbershop. is really good. good, good Barbershop's a great movie. It yeah. rules. It's and But do you know what I mean? Movie. Like when it came out, everyone was kind of like, oh, yeah, this is kind of going to – this is like a big deal. Yeah. Like you know yeah. what I mean? Like this kind of a movie hasn't come around in a while. I remember that had buzz. Like it was like they kind of might have cuts. something special here. It does have buzz cuts. Uh, I watched it again on TV recently. A movie it's good. that it's fucking great. slaps. It's, it's good. The, the sequels are mostly kind of like I think two is pretty good. <sighs> Two's got know. some bullshit in it. Two's pretty good. We know where I stand on Beauty Shop, unfortunately. Beauty Shop's pretty good. Um First Shop Three even is watchable. Haven't I Malcolm haven't D. Lee. I haven't seen that one. Yeah. The first um, one rolls on. Tim Story directed it. Yeah, his director best of film. Fantastic Four. Um Number two. Mm-hmm. The kind of movie that would be on Netflix now. It would go straight to Netflix. Hundred percent. hundred percent. It's a comedy mm-hmm. about two older actresses who are both big stars. It's kind of like one the of banger those Banger Sisters. The, the bangers, what? The Banger, the banger sisters. sisters. Goldie Hawn and Susan Sarandon, right, uh, are like two former kind of groupies, yes. right? Like they were oh, like wild which must in the be 60s. Based on, um, what were those? I know. I know what you're t- okay. Yes, got it. Yep. But but the idea is now Susan Sarandon sort of sold out and become domestic. Right, she's a suburban, right. you know, right? Like you know, like lamo and Goldie's still like wild. She's she like, comes, we got to, you know, don't you remember when we used to like you know party and right. have sex? Both of them with their tattoos. Yeah, their tattoos like form a heart. Right. Oh, um, uh, but aren't they like like they're not their last names aren't Banger, right? I don't think so. No. Uh, but that movie's kind of a flop, and then uh, Goldie Hawn doesn't make another movie until Snatched. Is that right? Yeah. Like, not, not a People single People were like, movie. oh, maybe Goldie Hawn never makes a, a movie ever again, and then she's done one since then. Yeah. Really? Three years ago and has not worked again since that movie. Uh, no, she played uh, Mrs. Claus in The Christmas Chronicles. It's a cameo role. I'm sorry. She plays Mrs. Claus yeah, in The— Yeah, because Kurt Russell is Mr. Yeah, Claus. I know, but I didn't know she was in it. It's a cameo. Wait, are they married in real life? Yeah. For every, you know, a million oh. years now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I remember that being kind of hyped at the time with like, hey, Goldie Hawn, like, respect. And it came out and everyone was like. Pfft. It was supposed to be like a comeback for her. Right. Like, remember Goldie? We all loved her. And then she just disappeared. Number mm. three yeah. is a, the, a phenomenon of okay. 2002. Number three. Just what, probably one of the craziest phenomenons. My, that big, fat Greek my big Fat Greek Wedding. In its 23rd Damn. week. Yeah. 23rd week. Yeah. In its twenty third week, it has wow. made one hundred and twenty four million dollars. It is the most absurd fucking, box office phenomenon of all time. We don't talk about it. A fucking really? TV yeah. sitcom movie yeah. about like a Greek lady marries a non Greek guy and her Greek family. Why, was sure. it, why did everyone go so crazy for it? It was like, just one of those things where like, it came out. Everyone was kind of like reviews were. If there were reviews, they yeah. were like it's cute, you know. And then just week after week, just built up buzz. There's nothing right. will ever like right. nothing will happen like that ever again. No, it's it's the box happen. office equivalent of lightning in a bottle. Yes. Like we were talking about right. Spirited Away being the artistic yes. lightning right. in but a bottle. But there was something about it where it's like I remember because my dad and I would read the box office together when it came out and we were looking at like the long box office list and variety. And he was like, whoa, why is my Big Fat Greek Wedding per screen average so high? Right. Like in its first weekend when it came out, he was like, that movie's overperforming for what looks like right. a very banal sitcom pilot. And then seven months later, it ran. It ran in theaters for it a had full outgrossed. year. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Fifty-two that's awesome. weeks. Yeah. I'm, is it good? I, it's like it's perfectly charming. Yeah, it's like is it the funniest comedy ever made? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Unfortunately. Well, yeah. Of course. Right. I mean, the wedding is big and fat. All right. yeah. No, it's fine. I remember seeing it on a plane and and laughing. I don't know. I haven't seen it since then. <sighs> Sounds good to me. That movie would not have a chance to perform that long. No. Today, right. people were seeing it, like especially old people were going out and seeing it multiple fucking times and taking their kids or taking right. their, yeah, yeah, their yeah, friends. Yeah. Or, I, my grandma, I think, saw it twice in theater. Its highest grossing weekend was its twentieth weekend. You know what I mean? It never hit number one at the box nope. office. That, it was that's number way, two. It made fourteen million dollars. That's the way to do it. But I remember the way that Entertainment Weekly talked about it was: it came out the same weekend as the Scorpion King. 
the first Dwayne Johnson vehicle. Sure. And the Scorpion right. King in its first weekend makes 40-something. 36. Okay. I, I, I have it right here. And Big Fat Greek Wedding in its first weekend. Opened at 20th. And made how much? $590,000. Right. And they were like, the big story was how well Scorpion King had opened. <laughs> and then by the end of its run, Big Fat Creek Wedding had quadrupled. <laughs> That's <laughs> so awesome. It made $240 million in America. It made 368 worldwide. So the only films that beat it that year are Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and Sp- Spider-Man, right? Is that correct? It's the fourth highest grossing uh, film? And Harry Potter. It was the fifth highest. So it's literally like the four biggest franchises. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the Greek wedding. And right. then the Greek wedding. And then like what if like a 35-year-old lady married a like non-Greek guy? It's not that ludicrous. Like the crazy thing she did was oh. married a non – like an Irish guy. Right. <laughs> like, and the Greek family is was like, her whoa, fam- whoa, Was whoa. her family like freaking out? Like why aren't you marrying a Greek He's guy? He's a vegetarian. Oh. They don't know how to deal with that. I can see this movie making a trillion dollars. <laughs> I didn't know he was a vegetarian. It was kind of one of those yeah. movies also where like my Jewish relatives were like, you know, they're kind of like yeah, us. You know, like, we're like every – like, 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 They're sort yeah. of like our people, it's these right. Greeks. Everyone's you know? culture. I guess we're not so different right. after all. But the uh, other crazy boy. thing is she never is able to replicate it. She no, never has another hit. She finally after 15 years is like, fuck she it. I'm doing Big make... Fat too. Right. Yeah, and it right. performs the exact way you expect that movie to perform. Like it does what you expected the first movie would have done. Really? Which is like, oh, it like held on pretty well and did like 40 million. It made 60. It made 60? Mm-hmm. That's kind of nuts. The crazier phenomenon with Big Fat Greek Wedding is the movie comes out. The movie happened because Tom Hanks is married to Rita Wilson, who's Greek. And it was like a one woman show that she did. Or she came out right. of the Groundlings oh. Theater. Right. And she it was, was her a one person. woman storytelling show. And Rita Wilson wanted to see it. They saw it. And he was like, oh, this is fine. She could get – let's hire her to write, adapt it. And they hire like a sitcom director to uh, to make the movie. And it was just like Tom Hanks's little – like he was throwing someone a bone. He had right. enough clout to give someone – Are you serious? 100%. Right. They're, list, they're the producers. It's because yeah. his wife was Greek and she brought him to the show. And he was like, yeah, why not? I'll let this woman direct a movie. Oh, my God. Or, or write a movie. She didn't even direct it. No, they started. hired a sitcom director. Ed Zwick Joel, 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 Joel Zwick. Zwick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not Ed Zwick not of Ed Glory. Zwick. Yeah, right. Um, but the movie comes out, right? It got a little attention because it was Tom Hanks. My dad was like, is that why it's doing well? But when it just seemed like, oh, this will be like a solid little indie programmer. I'll make a million, couple million, you know, end up maybe if it's a really big hit, it ends up at like nine or ten or whatever. It was released by, I think, IFC. It was I think it like IFC. funded IFC right. for years. <laughs> so within like two months of the movie coming out, maybe even less, CBS was like, you know what? This could be potential for a good sitcom. So they bought the rights to make it into a sitcom because they were like, well, the movie's not going to do great, but the value is right, right. you could adapt this into a real right, sustainable. Right, right. And then a year later, yep. the movie was one of the highest it, – it remains the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time. Right. And Really? Yes. Probably. And suddenly CBS was sitting on the rights to make a TV show out of it, and they did a TV show where everyone except for the husband returned. Like the biggest right. movie – Right. Now John suddenly, Corbett was like, no thanks. But no, every other no. cast member was on it. Right. And the biggest movie was now suddenly on television every week, a new 30 minutes. Yeah, but it got canceled right away. The first week, the ratings were humongous. Right, right. It was like the MASH finale. Right. And they were like, no show has premiered this 23 million viewers. In what? Like, right. And then by six weeks later, it was canceled. Yeah. Yeah. But it went from being people like... People saw it and they were like, oh, it's just the movie again? No, don't worry about it. But even <laughs> a year later, people were done with it. It was like, people were like, never has there been a more sure thing on television. Then it premieres bigger than she their expectations. She follows me on Twitter. Should we get her on? Let's get Nia Verdolas on the Oh show. my gosh, yeah. Are you kidding? Hmm? She might not... Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's tough to talk about. I don't know. It's fascinating. Know. She hosted SNL. She got nominated for an Oscar. She made five more movies. Yep. And none of them ever had... No. That kind of impact. But she's probably, you know, set forever. Yeah. Anyway, that's the story of the third movie. The fourth movie is about what if, like, Antonio Banderas and Lucy Liu faced off in some uh, sort of gun We're talking s- about scenario. Ballistic X versus Severn. Right. I wish you'd give me fewer clues. I just feel like after all that, we kind of need to... Uh... Sure. Speed also, up. I don't know. How do you fucking define Ballistic X versus Sever? It's based on a Game Boy Advance game. Wait, is that phrase you're saying the name of the movie? Ballistic, Ballistic colon, colon X versus, versus Sever. sever. 
It is based on the Game Boy Advance I game. I don't know how to process that as language. I believe the movie <laughs> came out before the game did. Like Maybe it was right oh, around okay. the same time. But like they had option. They were like, "This game is going to be so fucking huge. We got to beat it to the punch." This is going to be my big fat Greek wedding of games. Yeah. Ballistic X versus Saga. Oh, it, I remember that poster. And it's one of those things yeah. where it's like, "That's right. They're finally going against each other." Antonio Banderas, right? Lucy Liu. Uh, We've waited for them to clash. But also, one of those posters where people looked at the title and they were like, "Am I supposed to know what any of those right. words?" Yeah, that's how I kind of feel like, huh? It's right. also one of those movies that it, like attracts a reputation because it probably has like 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, it Everyone's does. like, wow, one of the worst movies of all time. You watch and you're like, oh, this is just like a boring it's action. A boor- it's, it's an airplane it's, movie. It's, it's, it's not like it's terrible. It's, it's just only that yeah, yeah. no one loved right. it. Right. right. I think it was directed by someone called Chaos. With a K? With a K. I know that guy. <laughs> you know that Do you guy? really? You yeah. know the director of Ballistic X vs. Sever? Yeah, he never, meant, he never told me he directed that movie. Wow. Though. Yeah. He also directed Tekken 2. Wow. Um, number five at the Was box that its office. opening I'm weekend? kidding. I yes. don't know. That, I don't know chaos. I, would, I, don't want, know chaos? I don't want some crazy street rumors totally to get started. I was totally ready though. to believe that. No, sorry. Uh, he's a Thai director. I don't know if he no. is uh, yeah, posted up in Brooklyn. All right. Number five. Uh, it's opening, opening weekend, $7 million. Yeah, not, not a big hit. Not a big hit. Cost 70 Yeah. I don't know why <laughs> it was funded. This is Warner Brothers, like yeah. a major studio. Right. Number five. Big epic. Big oscar kind of epic, but obviously bad because it's getting dumped in September. The Four Feathers? Lord of the Rings? Wait, what? The Four Feathers. Yes. Well, what, I, what's that one? It's West like a, Bentley. It's a classic story. Kate Hudson, um, a Heath famous Ledger. British adventure novel that's oh, been adapted okay. into like seven movies. There's a Corda film, right? Yeah. Uh, there's the there's multiple yeah. silent films. Yeah. This was them doing it again. Heath Ledger, Wes Bentley, a couple years off of American Beauty. Yeah. Uh, who and else Kate, Hudson. Kate Hudson. The point is, those three Jaiman were like Hansu. these are the next three major movie stars. Got it. And it's you know they they get the feathers because they're cowards, right. so they go to war. I believe it's set during uh, the war in Sudan in in like the the late eighteen hundreds. But that I've never is seen the it. movie okay. that like slows all three of them down. Yeah, and it was only just Ledger like a big ever bloated disaster. Yeah. it was from huh. the director of Elizabeth, so he Shakar right. Kapoor, so he was also seen as like, oh, this guy can do you a period. Right. You know, yeah. But I think everyone thought like these are three incredibly attractive, charismatic people who also have broken out in serious films. They are going to be classical movie stars. You Let's, know, they're going to be yeah. box office draws in like prestige films. Let's doing make intelligent it happen. Work, and it just like is like a, a poof. Poof. It's a total poof. So it's there you fart. go. Four yeah, it opened to six million dollars. That's huge disaster. A huge disaster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah colossal disaster. Uh, you've got one hour photo. You've got signs. Man. That swim fan, remember that one? That sounds familiar. Online kind of, stalker movie. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, the first dangers of the internet. Yeah, yeah, sort yeah. Of horror All film. right. You have Trapped, yeah. where Kevin Bacon traps Charlie Theron. Is that movie not directed by someone weird? I don't know. Find it. I feel like it is. <sighs> um, yeah, it's crazy. Big Fat Greek Wedding almost pulled off the thing, which as a child who uh, uh, tracked the box office with my father was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. Oh, boy. Here we go. What? Because this was happening the same summer as the Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire home run thing. Okay. Where every day my dad and my brother. No, it would... wasn't. No, not this wasn't. No. 98. Yeah, 98. The thing I'm about to tell oh, you. Oh, okay. okay. I thought you were talking about Big Fat It was like my dad and my brother would look at the newspaper and go like, fuck, they're both, they're coming up. They're right, coming up right, on the record. Right. And then we'd flip to the back page and my dad and I would go like, look at this thing that's happening, which was something about Mary opened at right. number six at the you box office, the right, and right. every week went up one uh, position. And it was perfect. It went like six. Right, yeah, yeah. Surprised this movie didn't yeah. open better. Right. And then, like, the word of mouth was good, and it was like five. Right. And I remember my dad and I going to see it and being like, this has got to be number one next weekend, right? No, it was four. Then I don't know, you're talking all this stuff about two. how you had such an. It sounds like you had a kind of fun childhood. There were parts. All right. There were parts. Tracking box office receipts with your dad every day. That sounds kind of fun. That was, I mean, that was the cornerstone of my childhood. Oh, okay. But. Uh, That's all there was. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I had a fine enough childhood. I was just a Growing very. up in New York. Sad right. and scared child. Right. I got it. Um, okay. But I, I felt uh, internal turmoil. I see. Um, but uh, my Big Fat Creek wedding almost pulled it off. And the thing that, that fucked it over was Swim Fam. It wasn't as clean. Number one. It wasn't as clean, but once it broke into the top ten, it kept on moving up. And then there was the series of like, now it's four, now it's three, now it's two, and everyone was like, this, it's it's finally going to be the weekend. The Big Fat Greek Wedding. Six months later is number one, and Swim Fan beat it by like a million dollars. I got Swim Fan. (sighs) What a great episode! Yeah, we're done. David, wait, hold on. We're not quite done. I have a coda. Okay, okay. Ben's been pointing at his watch. That doesn't exist. This will be quick. 
Ben's now giving a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to, at the end of his review in 2003, remember M- Nigel Andrews said, I can't imagine ever loving a movie more. Mm-hmm. So in preparation for this episode, I decided to contact him right. and find out if he has ever loved a movie more. He is not online. He has no social media preference. No Twitter. No. Right. So in order to send a letter to the editor of the Financial Times, I had to sign up for a subscription to the Financial <laughs> Times, which is $1 for four weeks and then $65 for every month thereafter. So I've wow. set an alarm to cancel the subscription. <laughs> you can put on the blank check expense. So I wrote to the editor of the Financial Times and said, please forward this to, to Nigel Andrews. This did is- not Did not expect to hear back, but yeah. let's see what happens. My email said, Dear Mr. Andrews, in your 2003 review of Spirited Away, you wrote, I don't expect ever to love a movie more, but then again, maybe I shall. I've always loved this line. Indeed, I still have a clipping of your original review from the FT. But now I have to know it's been 16 years. (laughs) Have you found a movie you love more than Miyazaki's? Best regards, David Reese. I got an email from the letters editor said, please find Nigel's answer below. Best wishes, Nicola. His answer, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's still the best. <laughs> Pure magic for grown-ups and children alike. At the same time, like so many, I wouldn't want to be stranded on a desert island without Vertigo and Citizen Kane. Fair. Wow. Right. So there so you go. A little go. respect to the, yeah, you know. But you know what the real profundity of the, of that review and, and his uh, star rating is? What's that? that? He's essentially saying, I can only do this one time. Oh, totally. I can only break the rules one time. And I have, I'm going into this review as a professional critic right. who has not only been seeing movies on the job for probably decades. several decades yeah, at yeah, this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also has like delved back into film history. I'm yeah. thinking about Citizen Kane. I'm thinking about Vertigo, films I never got the chance to review. Right, but my entire star rating system is essentially based on those movies being the best a thing can be. They're the hypothetical five, yeah. and I'm going to say that only one time in history, I hope I'm correct, a movie will warrant the six star. I mean, that's why it's so awesome. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Wow, what a great way to end. <sighs> I agree. And look at what we would have missed, Ben, if we listened to the rap tap tapping of your watch. Wow, Ben, that's not true at all. It was just a reminder, a friendly reminder, okay. that we've been recording for two hours and 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Great job. Oh, don't oh. Yeah, no, come on, Ben. Apologize. I feel like, I didn't, I feel like I didn't say anything smart, but there's one thing I wanted to say, you which is that smart, so. if, if, if this is a critique of, of Japan's current economy and, acqu- and, and acqu- acqu- what's the word? I don't know. Acquisitiveness. Mm. Sure. It's ironic that then she has to prove her worth by going to work in a service economy. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. That's there's a lot to think about. Okay. That's how it goes. You. No, you, <laughs> uh, David, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank for you for having being me. here, David. Um, it was really fun. Do you have anything you want to plug? Dick you want to Town? Talk when is Dick Town coming out? Uh, first of all, you can't. I don't. I can't say it. Leave it out, so. Ben. Well, when the fall, but they haven't made it okay. official. Well, so, sorry. Well, this episode is coming out in the fall. We will communicate with you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And either by the time this episode comes out, you will hear the thing I said, and you'll know when it's released. This will come out September 29th. So hopefully, it'll be out by then. Okay. Griff, Griffin and I were on a cartoon together. You it's know, your cartoon. You made fun of my droopy balls. It was it's, a career highlight. It's your cartoon, your show with, with fellow friend of the podcast, John Hodgman. And I uh, am on one episode making fun of your droopy balls. Exactly. Which is very fun. It was an honor and privilege that you let me make fun of your droopy balls. <sighs> was it a puzzle or a dream? Both. Yeah. I had to solve the puzzle in order <laughs> to, to live, achieve a dream To state. live the dream. Yes, to live the dream. Right. Um, and a perpetual plug, uh, if, if you have any way to watch Going Deep, it remains one of my favorite oh, shows of the decade. Oh, yeah. Thank you is, very is much. Is it any easier to find? No. I I feel like sometimes it cycles I in and like out of on weird, availability. Yeah. I kind of just want to dump it all on Vimeo. You kind of think you should. Right? Like, yeah. networks don't remember they made that. I really, <laughs> I, I'm not just saying Maybe I'll just put it all on Vimeo. Yeah. It's right. one of the shows that does give me such, uh, uh, Leaves me in such a state of relaxation. Oh, uh, that I find really comforting and reassuring, while also being like informative. I wish there were eight hundred episodes. Like I wish so I was I. able to watch it all the time. So do I. It was really fun. Yeah. But thank you for your support of it. It's a great show, and people thank should you. seek it out, and they should seek out the other show, which maybe has been bleeped at this point. Right. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Andrew Gruda for our social media, Joe Bone and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Lay Montgomery for a theme song. Go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to Tee Public for some real nerdy shirts. 
Uh, go to Patreon for our uh, Blank Check uh, special features. Uh, where right now uh, we're up to uh, uh, what what Marvel movie? We just did Black Panther, so I guess Ant Man is next or whatever the fuck, whatever's after Black Panther. Sure, that one. Infinity, Infinity War. War. Infinity War. That's Get ready zero. for an Infinity War commentary. Right. I'll be grumpy. Mm, boy, can't wait. Yep. Uh, don't like that movie. Uh, he doesn't like it. Yeah. He doesn't uh, know next the, week, know cool. The titular episode: Howl's Moving Castle. That's right. With Erlich. With Erlich. Yeah. He's ready. And as always, Shrek, Flush, and Outhouse. <laughs>